uh, members of staff, the members of the media and members of council, thank you for joining us. I'll declare the meeting open at 5.31 and I'd like to advise that the meeting is being recorded for the first time in accordance with the city's recording of council meeting policy. By being present at the meeting tonight, members of the public consent to this city recording and subsequently publishing uh, your voice on the city's website. I'd also like to advise online members that should you experiencing any technical difficulties this evening and leave the meeting, I'll call for a two minute adjournment. After this time, the meeting will recommence. And councillors, I'll begin as always by acknowledging that we're here this evening on Binjara of Country and pay my respects to elders past and present and those emerging. There are no apologies uh, this evening, but I will draw uh, the attention of the public to the important note in the agenda and advise that any decision that's made by council tonight can be revoked in accordance with the Local Government Act. So please don't take any action until you've received advice by council in writing. There are no questions on notice. Um, and I will be amending the standing orders for this evening's meeting to allow for online participation. Council, the motion is on the screen before you. I won't read it out, but I'll move it and ask for a second. A second of the Deputy Mayor. Is there anyone opposed? The motion's carried. And Council, I'll be um, firstly changing the order of proceedings this evening. Uh, the first item that we'll be conducting is announcements, and that is to afford us to recognise our local legend for this month. Not one, but a cluster of local legends. Uh, and uh, it's my real privilege um, to introduce you to a group of people who you know for their service across this community. Um, it's my privilege to acknowledge that the August 2024 local legend is the Zonta Club of Peel. You're all well familiar with the work of the Zonta Club. For more than 30 years, this group of remarkable women have been serving this place, both through their actions as individual leaders in the community and as an association, flying the flag for Zonta International and contributing to really important local causes. And some of those things include, of course, the only uh, Missing Persons Memorial Day to be held in Western Australia, here in Mandra at our memorial uh, locally and uh, put together entirely by members of the Zonta Club. Also supporting um, the silent march uh, for domestic violence, um, creating birth birthing kits that are spread throughout the world. And I've had the opportunity once to join them. I learned about how you have to burp the birthing kits to ensure that they can travel uh, on planes. Um, as well as Zonta uh, Golf Days that's raised more than $300,000 for breast cancer research. Uh, an amazing organisation that does so much. Can I say to the members of the Zonta Club, we're so grateful to you for your service. We really are just so grateful to you for your leadership, your wisdom and the contribution that you make to this place. Mandra is a better place because you're in it. And so on behalf of all of us, um, can I just say to you, um, you have our deep gratitude to you and all of your members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor Williams and councillors, on behalf of the Zonta Club, thank you. This is indeed an honour. As president of the Zonta Club, I, along with the ladies here tonight and those who weren't able to come, graciously accept this award and do so by acknowledging the over 445 years of volunteering to Zonta provided by the current group of members. This doesn't include those who've come and left us. I'd also like to acknowledge that our present members serve on many other boards throughout the community and other volunteer work. When Mayor Williams attended our changeover dinner in May, he mentioned that he was grateful that our regular meeting night didn't fall, fall on the council meeting night. We're now grateful that it doesn't either because we could come <laughs> tonight, so thank you. Um, as Mayor Williams said, Zont is an international organisation, an international humanitarian organisation working to build a better world for women and girls. We do all of the things that Mayor Williams said, plus more. Um, we make toilet bags for women in over, so we've done over 60,000 birthing kits um, and we do awards and scholarships for local girls and women. It's important to acknowledge though that we couldn't do a lot of this work without the support from community, businesses, and indeed the city of Mandurah, both in kind and in the form of grants, so thank you. In conclusion, as our meetings no longer fall on a council night, ladies, please come along and check us out. 
gentlemen, please ask the women in your lives to come along and check us out. That way, we'll continue our thriving membership for the next 31 years and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. And as councillors are aware, one of the things that happens um, when we award the local legend is that those um, nominees then become part of the Australia Day Citizen of the Year Awards. And so we'll be forwarding on for the 2026 awards uh, nomination for the Zonta Club. Um, councillors, of course, over the course of the month, there's been a lot of activities happening across the city and we'll now take a moment just to reflect on a few of them. First of all, a very fitting recognition by the Deputy Mayor um, who attended with other councillors the Zonta Missing Persons Memorial Day. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. So on the 2nd um, of August, um, Zonta, who we've heard, um, held the Missing Persons Memorial Service. Um, this annual event uh, this year saw the unveiling of the new plaque, which is a credit to the Zonta Group for achieving that, and it's made a really special place in that area. The numbers of people that attend the annual event grows each year as we come together to put our arms around those um, that continue to suffer the unimaginable pain of having um, lost a, um, a loved one. So I really want to thank you for all that you do in raising awareness on that. Um, it really is uh, such a significant day and um, it's always well attended. So. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. And Councillor Wilkins, on behalf of the Council, attended the Peel Football and Netball League Gala event. And Councillor Wilkins, now over this side of the chamber. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, earlier this month, I had the pleasure to represent the City of Mandra at an event I always enjoy attending, the Peel Football and Netball League uh, Deb Clancy Medal Gala Night, um, which was an, another awesome night. Um, I joined other invited guests, Robin Clark, MLA, and her husband, Charlie, uh, Liberal candidate Owen Mulder, and wife, Bronya, as well as representatives from Alcoa and Bendigo Bank to celebrate the best local netballers. This year, I again had the pleasure of presenting the top goal scorer, and wow, what an amazing season they had. Um, especially, uh, uh, all of them uh, recorded record uh, amounts of goals, but especially Central's footballer, uh, sorry, Central's footballer netball club goal scorer, Steph Edmonds, who amassed a record-breaking 592 goals uh, for the season at an average of 42 goals per game. Um, yeah, it was amazing. Uh, and believe it or not, it, it, that's not the record for the for the Peel League. It's an, it, over 600 was the record. It's amazing. Um, she was also named uh, in the reserves All Star team and took out the reserves MVP award. Uh, Pinjara Football and Netball Club seniors player um, Saronia Nakaville um, was awarded the league MVP, beating a star-studded field including ex. Beaver star Andrea Gilmore and a number of Peel Lightnings players. There's plenty of highlights throughout the season. Um, one of the main highlights was um, the two teams that were introduced uh, into the league from Secret Harbour. Um, they are the Secret Harbour Dockers Football and Netball Club. Two teams made the grand final in their first year. Uh, yes, Mayor, two Dockers teams made the finals. Well, um, <laughs> better than the actual Dockers. <laughs> That's right. Um, congratulations to all the award winners and uh, thanks again to everyone from the PFNL for another wonderful night. Thank you very much, Councillor Wilkins. Councillor Burns, on behalf of the Council with other members, attended the Vietnam Veterans Day. Councillor Burns. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Vietnam Veterans Day in Australia is observed on the 18th of August every year. Originally set for the Battle of Long Tan, it now incorporates all service in that conflict. Uh, remembering the service and sacrifice of Australians who served for the entire Vietnam War. We were honoured to hear the Mr Peter Ramsey recount his service of the New Zealand Armed Forces in Vietnam and beyond. The Doris, Dawesville RSL Club did a fantastic job in holding this year's commemorative service where it has typically be done by the Mandra RSL. So uh, much congratulations should go towards the Dawesville RSL sub-branch. I again enjoyed catching up with many of our local veterans and families, uh, much to the, um, the risk of hanging around for too many hours hearing old war stories. I finished the afternoon by visiting our town centre to see the lights of the bridge lit green and gold in testament to the service men and women of the Vietnam War. So thank you for the city officers for arranging that. Thank you very much, Councillor Burns. 
Um, and uh, finally, councillors, can I just recognise that um, we were very fortunate to be able to celebrate three of our outstanding elected members at the Wolga Local Government Awards uh, earlier in the month. Um, can I acknowledge Councillor Shoemaker and Councillor Jackson, who both received merit awards for their service to local government, and Councillor Peter Rogers, who uh, received the Troy Pickard Young Achiever Award for his contribution. Um, very worthy recipients half as much as what you deserve for the contribution that you've made this to this place and we really appreciate you we'll show you through a round of applause um councillors uh, in announcing that there were no apologies uh, it was remiss of me not to acknowledge that councillor kearns who is attending the meeting is attending online councillor kearns has been quite unwell and she was desperate to get here tonight but the doctors told her she was to stay home and uh, so therefore she's joining us online Councillor Kearns, we wish you a speedy recovery and thanks for joining us this evening. And we'll now enter public question time. Um, yes, um, CEO has just reminded me that the Zonta Club may, you may now leave if you like. Um, personally, I'll never understand why you won't want to stay for the meeting, but I understand you're off to the pub now, uh, so uh, enjoy yourself. Just waiting for a changeover of the gallery attendees. There's a group coming through. Councillors, um, as you are aware, and for the benefit of the members of the public, there is significant public participation involved in tonight's meeting. This forms both public question time and deputations. The question time is an opportunity for members of the public to ask a question to the meeting. Deputations, um, having been submitted in advance and approved by myself, provide an opportunity for members of the public to speak to an item that's on the agenda this evening. Um, it's important to note that this meeting is governed by the City of Mandra's standing orders and therefore in relation to both public question time and deputation time, the meeting has to comply with those standing orders. A couple of things to make you aware of. Firstly, and whilst we welcome both your questions and your deputations, um, no statements can be made within your deputations or questions that reflect adversely on any person in this chamber or any person, and um, no statements can be made that are knowingly incorrect or misleading. In relation to questions, it is a time for public questions uh, and therefore, uh, to a reasonable extent, it's not an opportunity for a preamble or um, a providing an opinion. It's an opportunity to ask a question. I'm sure I don't need to uh, remind us that when we're in uh, this chamber, we're here um, showing courtesy and respect to the meeting uh, and we would ask that you follow that. We do have, as I said, a significant number of both questions and deputations and so um, I'll ask for your patience, we are going to walk through these uh, one by one. To begin with, could I ask uh, Mr. Daniel Freeman um, to come to uh, the microphone, uh, raising a question in, relo in relation to Local Planning Scheme 12, Amendment 4, Lot 801. Thank you for being here tonight and we welcome your question. No worries, thank you. Um, yeah, good evening, Mayor Williams and Councillors. I'm here on behalf of the um, Pleasant Grove development. So my question, excuse me. I'm here on behalf of my wife and myself from 35 Honey Tree. My question to council is with regards to the idea that there would be retention of trees and habit habitable floor level shrubs, grass trees, plant life surrounding the immediate ecosystem. How is this possible, the idea of reducing the blocks from the R5 to now R10? Um, and maybe lower, uh, is that achievable? 
regard in regards to underground power, water, uh, deep sewerage system, etc. We see how new developments are executed and not a tree is standing. This area, lot 801, is a sensitive area and would normally be you know, set aside maybe for conservation or parklands. Thank you, Mr. Freeman, for your question. I'll direct the question through the CEO to the coordinator of statutory planning and lands, Mr. Aaron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through yourself, the, propose, the proposal is to apply an R10 density. However, as noted in the recommendation, the minimum lot size is proposed to be 1,000 square metres and an average of 1,300 square metres across the site. The addition, uh, the, the addition me uh, measures applied through the requirements of local development plans to each lot to any develop prior to any development or subdivision provide greater protection of vegetation on the sites than currently exists. The provision of water, electricity and sewerage in infrastructure exists regardless of the densi density. However, through the civil design stage, the city would be seeking to engage boring technologies and other methods to install such infrastructure to minimise any adverse impact on vegetation. And the subject lot is currently zoned residential under the scheme and the existing adjacent foreshore area was ceded to the Crown as a part of the original subdivision some time ago. Thank you, Mr Lucas. Um, Mr Freeman, thank you very much for your question. Uh, the next question this evening is by Ms Lisa Gray. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, good evening. My name is Lisa Gray. I reside at Five Pleasant Grove Circle Falcon. And good evening, Councillors, CEO, Mayor Williams. Wrong way, sorry. Uh, first question, I do have a few. First question, has every councillor who is voting in favour of this amendment physically attended and thoroughly viewed Lot 801 Pleasant Grove Circle to take into consideration what the reality of this amendment will result in? Um, I, I can assure you that I have attended the site. Um, public question time is not an opportunity for members of the council to respond directly to the questions, but I've attended the site on a number of occasions um, yep. and um, certainly very familiar with it. Okay, so my, my next question does follow on from that. If the answer to my previous question is no, which obviously can't be expressed in this moment, would the council consider delaying the final vote on this item until this has occurred? Thank you. And next question is, would the council and developer consider a remapping of the lot allocations to allow a mix of, example, 25% lots of minimum 1,000 square metre interspersed with 25% minimum 1,500 square metre and 50% remaining at the 2,000 square metre, which is currently zoned at, with the 2,000 square metre lots placed to strategically preserve more trees. Thank you. I'll direct the question through the CEO to the coordinator of planning and lands. Thank you, Mr Mayor, through yourself. The subdivision layout has not yet been finalised and is intended to modify the layout in order to maximise tree retention. However, based on the indicative lot layout, the lots proposed, there are 27 lots between 1,000 and 1,200 square metres, which constitutes about 37%. There are 18 lots between 1,200 and 1,300 square metres, which constitutes about 24.5%. And there are 28 lots over 1,300 square metres or about 38.5%. And, and just to reassure you, um, the answers to the questions that you're asking will be included, which will be available in time. Yep. You've got them to your left. Thank you very much. The tree survey with the application indicates trees that are in fair or poor condition, leaning or dead, among other uh, categories. However, there's no overlay on this as to the fact that wildlife utilise these trees as much as the ones in good condition, i.e. osprey nests made in dead trees. So leaning dead and fallen trees are a haven for the wildlife, yet deemed perhaps disposable um, in, the, in the process of 
of the development. Is the council going to assess this aspect of the vegetation before taking this amendment further? Thank you. I'll direct the question to Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through yourself. The recommendation includes additions to the specific site area table in Schedule 1 of the scheme, which results in the requirements for the preparation and approval of an environmental management plan, an EMP, prior to any development or subdivision. As part of this EMP is the requirement for fauna management. It is also required through the specific site requirements that prior to any development or subdivision, the local development plans, LDPs, are to be prepared and approved. The proposed use of uh, these LDPs, the purpose of these LDPs is to investigate on a lot by lot basis and establish tree protection zones to maximise tree prote protection. Thank you. Uh, there is anecdotal evidence from residents adjoining and close by to, late, to lot 801 that can confirm that there is black cockatoo breeding on this lot. The juveniles are seen annually. Is the council willing to delay a decision on this matter until further investigation surveys have taken place? The existing reports state that there is no breeding re uh, recorded. Uh, however, as I said, it was anecdotal, uh, but it seems quite evident that there is breeding occurring on that lot. Thank you, Mr. Lickett. Uh, perhaps through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll perhaps address the delay, um, potential delay to making the decision. When first initiated, the proposed amendment was considered to be, a complex, to be complex due to the absence of a coastal hazard risk assessment. However, this has been since occurred and the amendment could now be considered standard. As per the development, Planning and Development Local Planning Scheme Regulations of 2015, Part 5, Division 2, um, Regulation 41, the consideration period is 90 days from the close of a submission period. and before the end of the consideration period uh, for a proposed complex amendment to a local planning scheme or a later date approved by the Commission, the local government must pass a resolution to either support the amendment without modification, support the amendment with, the, with proposed modifications or to not support the uh, proposed amendment. This consideration period ends prior to the uh, September round of council, which does limit our ability to be able to delay it. Um, if the amendment is considered to be standard under Regulation 50 of the same Act, that literally occurs today, that 60-day period. In response to the, uh, to the question re recommending... Uh, in response to the, uh, to the issue of the cockatoos, The LDPs and the EMPs that, do, uh, that the developer is obliged to provide, um, the developer is also obliged to provide a referral to the Commonwealth under the provisions of the Environmental Pro Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999, which is called the EPBC Act. It is understood the developer has already commenced the required referral. And thank you very much for your questions and the way in which you approach them. And as I said, we'll ensure um, not only that they're in the minutes, but that you'll be alerted to the responses to your questions. Uh, our next questions uh, this evening are from Sharif Van Wingerden. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name, but I'll welcome you to the microphone to ask your questions. Is Mrs. Van Wingerden here this evening? She's not. It's not a problem. I'm happy to ask her questions that she's provided in advance. Um, question one was, can I just confirm, is she waiting in the other gallery? The person asking the question is not in the room. I'll continue. Um, the first question was within the Mandra City Council's own biodiversity strategy, Carnaby, Borden and Forest red-tailed black cockatoos are all recognised as being critically low numbers across their natural range. Also ring-tailed possums and western grey kangaroos. How then do councils justify the removal of a significant number of foraging and habitat trees for these species 
also given that these trees are listed as being critically endangered at our remnant Indigenous vegetation? And I'll direct the question to Mr Lucas. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The developer is obliged to refer the proposal to the Commonwealth under the uh, provisions of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. It is understood that the developer has all, already commenced this requirement. The recommendation includes additions to the specific site area table in Schedule 1 of the scheme, which result in the requirement of the preparation and approval of an environmental management plan and a, a, as part of this EMP, the requirement for fauna management. In addition, measures applied through the requirements of the local development plans to each, each lot prior to any development or subdivision provide greater protection to vegetation on the site than currently, currently exists. And the second question, thank you, Mr. Lucas, is there scope within the city's bushland acquisition scheme and biodiversity protection targets to acquire the site in question, lot 801 Pleasant Grove Circle, or significant parts thereof for the conservation of at-risk flora and fauna and the protection of the city environment for future generations? Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When the city considers properties for acquisitions under the bushland buyback scheme, that property is assessed against seven different criteria. Significance of flora and fauna in the citywide context, size and geographical location or linkage value, ecological values, landscape values, level of threat to environmental values, local sense of place and total cost. The property that is assessed as having strong attributes against these criteria would be recommended for acquisition. Officers have conducted a broad desktop assessment of properties that are likely to have strong attributes against these criteria and identified properties within Mandra that should be further considered for acquisition if they become available on the market. The property in question has not been identified previously as a likely candidate for acquisition under the Bush Buyback Scheme through this broad desktop assessment process. Additionally, from officers' observations of the site at ground level, the property would not uh, property would hold some environmental values, but not enough to warrant acquisition under the scheme. This is largely related to the poor condition of the understory, long narrow shape of the property, a lack of linkage with other bushland reserves, and anticipated high cost of purchasing the property. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Um, we've received a number of other questions this evening. Um, I'll firstly invite Ms. Alison Dixon um, to the microphone to ask her question. Welcome. Hello, good evening, councillors, mayor, CEO, and the public. Um, my question is, and if you don't mind, if I could just add a little one in there, just a little one, is West Australian Planning Commission seems to be a really powerful commission. Is I have no idea if there is an overseeing body watching their decisions, but so far the decisions they have been making throughout Mandra and what I've seen have been really devastating. Thank so you. I'll, I'll take would the question. You, is it, there a possibility that the councillors here can lobby the state government? Uh, in relation to lobbying, uh, the individual application, the individual uh, proposals is not the appropriate place for lobbying. And the best influence that councils can have is in relation to the uh, policies and the strategic agenda that the commission um, is taking. However, uh, we haven't been invited to take part in that, and it's very much a state government mechanism. In relation to oversight of the West Australian Planning Commission, we'll direct the question and test the knowledge of the coordinator uh, to Mr Lucas. Uh, thank you. Through the Mayor, I guess uh, there's a number of um, bodies that can oversee different aspects of uh, how the Commission conducts itself, including ombudsmen, if, if there's questions about how process is undertaken. But ultimately, um, the Minister for Planning has, has complete oversight of the department and the chairman of the WAPC. Thank you very much. Interesting. I just find that a very powerful commission then. My next little question is, as you know, I work with wildlife um, and I'm a strong advocate for it. Um, I have monitored ringtails in Wanana, very close to this development. I would just like to make it clear 
our in planning and everyone present that it's really appropriate to either have an environmental impact assessment done on this site, not what has been said, but an environmental impact assessment uh, on this Anadley, site. No, this is question time. <laughs> Thank you. You do have an opportunity to make a deputation if you like, um, but uh, having said that, I will Thank take you. I will take a question in that and direct it to Mr. Lucas, who will be oh, able to respond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'd say that the, prior to any subdivision or development happening, uh, the, the insertions into Schedule 1 of the scheme require environmental management plans, including fauna relocation and fauna management. And uh, the LDPs, it is intended to be a lot by lot evaluation of the vegetation in situ. Um, and there'd be intent to make adjustments to any lot boundaries and um, shapes of lots to accommodate the uh, the best possible outcomes for tree retention. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. And, and also, um, really can, I, can I take the opportunity to thank you for your services to the community that you undertake? Thank you very much. Um, the next question uh, that I have this evening is uh, by uh, Ms. Karen Thompson. Could I invite you to the microphone? My question is, how will the displaced water from all the planned infill be prevented from lifting water levels during flood for all the other residents of the area? Thank you very much for your question. It, it is followed by, will it be the developers or the council who become liable when our properties are no longer insurable because of the flood risk? And we all know that's happening all over Australia right now. Thank you very much for your question. I'll direct the question to Mr. Lucas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, the LDPs uh, and the proposed style of development isn't a, a lifting of the lots other than uh, where the habitable rooms will be. The rest of the lots, it is intended to keep at their natural level. I would also say that uh, as part of the assessment, uh, the developer engaged an engineer to do a coastal hazard risk assessment. Uh, the results of which uh, show that the erosion line for any flood um, are a little bit further from uh, from the habitable rooms or from any residents that we actually anticipated. So uh, the, the level of fill that would once have, once have been assumed to be 2.7 uh, above the Australian height datum, it now looks to be 2.4 as the minimum. So there's less fill involved. Um, and Every time a square of fill is landed, it doesn't matter if it's I'm that sorry. high or that high. I'm sorry, as I've made clear, this is an opportunity to ask questions, um, not to make statements. Um, but I think in the spirit of what you're trying to say, I'll ask Mr Lucas to incorporate your comments in response to his answer. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And further, uh, one of the uh, requirements for any subdivision proposal would be an urban water management plan, which would certainly address um, how the water moves across the site. Thank you. And, and the second you, part with liability. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Uh, I'm not in a position to answer on behalf of an insurance yes. Thank you. agency, I'm afraid. Thank you very much for your questions. We appreciate you being here this evening. The next question is by Mr. Peter Wynn. Mr. Wynn here. Uh, our next question is by Mr. Bran Perry. Mr. Perry. You know, I'm okay. You do put me last in question time. I'm getting a complex. You're not last. I've still got another couple to go. No. Anyway, if somebody makes a submission as they can under the Act, do all the councils get a copy of that submission? Thank you. I'll direct the question to the CEO. Through you, Mayor. Yes, they do. Thank you. Any other questions? They do. All those structures in Mandra Terrace, you know, frozen yogurt, um, Betty's Burgers, have they had approval? Uh, thank you. I'll direct the question to the CEO. All operations. Sorry, can you repeat your question actually again? Mantra Terrace, yeah. frozen yogurt, 
at his burgers. They've attached the tables to the footpath. They don't even take them in at night. You can't get past. For you, Mayor, yes, they have received approval. They have. What happened to the lane, uh, bike lane in Allnut Street? Uh, thank you. Um, in relation to the public access, um, all of those um, uh, considerations have been made and included within the City of Mandurah's integrated uh, transport plan. I'll direct the question uh, in the first instance, the executive manager for Mr. Ingle. In relation to um, act, bike access and public access through the alfresco areas on Mandurah Terrace. Yes, so uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, when those assessments are made, there's an assessment of the build, building structure and also the uh, disability access uh, provisions. And through the alfresco permits that are issued, we make sure that there's a clear area of um, two metres um, past um, uh, the seating infrastructure and engineering um, certifications for um, the infrastructure that's put in place. Thank you. Any other questions? So they're allowed to attach the tables to the footpath, are they? Permanently. Yes. They are. Oh. They are. That's it. Thank you very I've much. I've got plenty more questions, but you're busy tonight. Thank you very much. And so we look forward to seeing you next time, Mr. Perry. Uh, our next question this evening is from Mr. Jim Menzies. Uh, and Mr. Menzies, you've got a number of questions. Please welcome to the microphone. And thanks for being here. Pardon? Hello, everybody. Um, Myself and a few residents of Olga Street and the Dow Dower Street vicinity have been working closely with um, our local councillor Sharon Wright regarding a number of issues reg um, around the current condition of the Dow Street car park and uh, the lack of maintenance in the area. Uh, a homeless person living in the car park for approaching now three years, currently living in a, a trolley tent setup. And the third part of the uh, question is around the traffic condition, the current condition of traffic in the Allgate Parkview area streets. Um, looking for some feedback from the council ultimately. And Thank you. Um, thanks for your question. I'm going to direct them in the first instance to the Director of Built and Natural Environment. Uh, through the Mayor, in regard to the first uh, three questions, if I could please take those questions on notice in order to be able to investigate those matters and provide a response. In regard to the traffic conditions um, in Allgate Street, uh, there has been previously a number of studies undertaken and, and certainly some mitigation measures, um, including intersection uh, improvements made. Uh, the city uh, is intending to undertake some additional modifications to that intersection um, treatment at Parkview, Allgate Street, um, through the current um, budget program, um, and then undertake some further investigations to understand any need for further investigations. Um, in subsequent years. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any subsequent questions? Not at the moment, thank you. Um, I'm sure you know this already, but for the benefit of members of the public, any questions taken on notice, the response is then included within the agenda uh, within the minutes. So, you can find the response to that. We'll also, um, if you provided your uh, details to us, you have, uh, we'll provide you with the answer directly as well. Very good. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Members of the public, thank you very much for the way that you've participated in public question time this evening. Um, I just want to check there was one person missing, um, Mr. Wynne. Are you in the chamber and would you like to ask your question? Yes. Please feel free to come to the microphone if you wish to ask your question. Thanks very much for being here. My name's Peter Wynn and I reside at 15 Keyside Close in Hall's Head. Good evening to you all. My query was in relation to Hall Park. I raised the issue in relation to how come we're proceeding down this path, or the council's proceeding down this path for a community park. Uh, it seems to me that uh, why are we doing this when it's for the good of the community? Um, and it seems to be driven by the unholy dollar again. Uh, Mr. Yes. Wynne, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I appreciate it. I'll respond. Um, Council will be considering that item this evening. At the moment, it's a proposal. Council will make a decision whether to continue on. As you're aware, there is already a commercial operator on the site. Um, Council's goal is to find 
a, a long-term tenant um, that could um, fulfill that commercial element. But rest assured, um, the vast majority of that site uh, is not only re retained as community, um, but will also be improved um, as a result of the transformation project that, that this plan oversees. So um, you'll get to hear all of the detail in the debate this evening, I'm sure, um, but that's the basis in which the commercial decision is made. It is already uh, has a commercial element on it, and this is simply about looking at the best commercial outcome going forward. Sure you will. I mean, it is the people's park, and I think it should remain the people's park. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for all that. Um, now, I'm going to close public question time at 10 past six. Uh, and whilst we have a number of deputations, we've got another couple of things to get through first. So, and first of all, uh, there are no public statements, but there is a leave of absence request from Councillor Pond from the 29th of September till the 23rd of October, 2024. Could I ask for a mover and a seconder that that be confirmed? Councillor Shoemaker moved. Uh, Councillor Smith seconded. Is there anyone opposed to that? It's carried. Councillors, there are a number of petitions this evening uh, that will be presented to Council. Councillor Shoemaker uh, will present, first of all, a request for a footpath in Panola Way, Hallshead. Councillor Shoemaker. Oh, thank you, through the Chair. Uh, I would like to present to Council a petition that contains the signatures of 112 residents, all of which have been verified, who are requesting that Council provide a footpath at Panola Way Hall's Head for the safety of the residents in the Masonic Hall's Head Village and Parkland Villas Mandra. I would like to move that the petition be received and referred to relevant officers. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there a seconder for the motion? Seconded, Councillor Rogers. Is there anyone opposed? Motion is carried. The next item, uh, the next petition to present to Council is by myself. Uh, it's in relation to an objection to Western Foreshore development proposal. I'd like to present to Council a petition that contains the signatures of 565 residents, of which 519 are verified, who are objecting to the Western Foreshore development proposal. I'd like to move that the petition be received and referred to relevant officers. Is there a seconder, Councillor Shoemaker? Is there anyone opposed? Questions carried. See you. The final petition this evening will be presented by Councillor Smith in relation to a request to consider local planning scheme 12 amendment to number four lot 801 Pleasant Grove Circle. Councillor Smith. I'd like to present to Council a petition that contains the signatures of 230 residents, of which all are verified, who are requesting that Council consider that the only R code suitable for lot 801 Pleasant Grove Circle is R5 and the prevailing tree preservation regulations be applied as necessary to each individual lot once subdivided under R5. I'd like to move that the petition be received and referred to the relevant officers. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Is there a seconder for the motion? Seconded, Councillor Zalani. Is there anyone opposed? Motion's carried. Now move into deputations uh, as there are no presentations. As I said to you earlier, we have a number of deputations this evening, so we'll get right in it, but just allow me to remind you that the um, Deputations must comply with the city's standing orders. Uh, no offensive language, no statements that are knowingly incorrect, misleading or reflect adversely on the integrity of any person. Um, I'd like to begin by inviting Warren Gore to the microphone in relation to Pleasant Grove. Thank you very much for being here. It's a five minute deputation. Please don't be offended if at around about four minutes, I just give you a heads up that you've got a minute left. Won't be offended, I'll be under five minutes. Um, so good evening, uh, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for having us here tonight. So my deputation relates to concerns at modifying R code density from R5 to R10 for lot 801 Pleasant Grove Circle, thereby increasing the density from 48 to 74 lots will lead to an increase in building waste, a narrow issue, but nevertheless an issue in the neighbouring wetlands and will have an environmental, a detrimental environmental impact on that area. So to illustrate, I provided a PowerPoint presentation, I'm very prepared, um, in advance of this meeting to each of the councillors. Do you have that in front of you? Yes, that's been circulated to all elected members. It's in front of you. Lovely. So um, the first series of photographs were taken on the 21st of April 2024. So um, if you take yourself through those photographs, as you can see for everyone else in the room, there's rubbish in each of those photographs. And that's building rubbish, which has resulted in the building of one single dwelling in the development area or next to the development area, uh, that's 45 Pleasant Grove Circle. So it's a building rubbish from that development of that house. So the second series of photographs were um, taken on the 24th of August, so a couple of days ago. 
Um, they still show building waste in the development area or in close proximity to the development area, but it's now embedded into the environment. So it's in the ground, it's in that wetland area, it's now covered by weeds. Um, it's really clear in the photographs um, and it's also in direct proximity to the wildlife. So if you go to the final photograph, there's a duck and the duck is swimming around in rubbish, which is really quite sad. Um, so it's only really reasonable and logical to expect that increasing the density um, from R5 to R10, thereby, you know, 48 to 74 lots in that area, um, for would proportionately increase um, both the building waste and its negative impact on the environment. So the building waste issue could be managed um, by imposing a waste management plan or whatever the council normally does in these circumstances to be implemented from the outset of the development. However, the site-specific requirements in the recommendation to council lack any measures to manage or eliminate building waste, which as shown in the photographs, which you have in front of you this evening, um, is a significant ongoing issue. Finally, it's our understanding that the applicant, the developer, hasn't made any efforts to date to ensure building waste is appropriately managed during development. And if it had, there wouldn't be building waste embedded in the environment at present, that is as of a couple of days ago. Um, so this lack of inaction should be viewed by the council as indicative of the applicant's future conduct regarding the proposed development, their general attitude towards environmental stewardship and their intention with respect to any environmental um, requirements that are imposed on them with respect to the development. So therefore, and very importantly, the council should consider this building waste issue, which I appreciate is quite narrow, but it is still important. Um, and the applicant's apathy and inaction when making um, their decision this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for your deputation. And I wouldn't usually respond to deputations, but given the practical nature of your comments, um, whilst the um, kind of the rules that govern um, the, the building uh, will come at a later stage through the subdivision stage, um, what we will ask is for our city officers to go and do an inspection of the current site. Um, clearly, you've raised some issues in relation to the condition of the current site pre-development. And so, um, I reassure you, we'll have someone do an inspection of that um, in relation to the broader context. Um, Mr. Lucas, did you have any response that you wish to add? No, thank you very much for your deputation. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, the next um, deputation is from Ralph Lambert in relation to Pleasant Grove Circle. Could I welcome you, Mr Lambert, to the mm. deputation table? Same scenario, um, five minutes and I'll, I'll indicate it four minutes. I'm from 20 Branchfield Way. When presenting this deputation, I have in mind those who are unable to attend this evening. That would be future generations of flora and fauna. Thank you for the opportunity to present this deputation. For the last 26 years, my family and I have had the privilege of living in this area that has a close relationship with the natural environment. In recent times, we have seen that relationship deteriorate as solid fences go up and trees come down. That relationship will be further eroded by, if this proposal goes ahead. The R5 zoning is in keeping with the rest of Pleasant Grove. In my opinion, once the block size is reduced to between 1,300 and 1,000 square metres, the environmental link between the greater part of Pleasant Grove and the estuary reserve will be lost. That said, I'm aware that some of the committee are very committed to the proposed amendments. As a compromise, I think there is an opportunity to reduce the proposed block size further allowing dwellings to make a smaller footprint. This could allow for, for a small increase in the total number of dwellings and have the scope to create clusters of trees between groups of houses. The allocated trees could be vegetated to make a well-balanced, sustainable habitat. Much argument, much of the argument is in support of the proposed amend, sorry, of the proposed amendments is based on local development plans that are designed to protect trees. I'm concerned that LDPs have an administrative value, but in reality may not create a long-term sustainable habitat. The proposed amendments retain standalone trees on private land. Single trees offer refuge for passing, for passing birds, and in my view, little else. 
single trees on private land are, like, are likely, more likely to die and less likely to be replaced. Trees on blocks of a thousand square meters can often be regarded as detrimental to the lifestyle of the property owners, thus leading to inappropriate care. The loss of trees through natural causes or man-made -man intervention, intervention can often add value, add financial value to a small property. That value can be offset by any pen, by penalties that may apply. In fact, the loss of scattered individual trees over time will have little impact on the habitat overall. Therefore, they have little value. There is no question that trees will be lost as a result of any development. If an amendment is to be made, we need to add environmental value to the trees that are retained. I believe that any amendments must have some long-term environmental value incorporated into the development. I do not see that in the plan that is proposed for this land. On that basis, I don't support the amendment. I would also like to note that we are all responsible for the protection of the reserve area, irrespective of what happens to the private land. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your deputation. Our next deputation is by Julie Dodge, representing Julie and Neil Dodge, speaking against the office, officer's recommendation in relation to Pleasant Grove Circle. Thank you very much for being here. Good evening, Mayor Williams and councillors and general public. Um, my name is Julie Dodge and I preside at 39 Branchfield Way that backs onto the um, proposed site. So in the first and foremost instance, we propose that the environmental considerations, the high impact over time of clearing, not just the initial clearing that happened, adding to the destruction of trees affects climate change, which needs to be considered completely when planning and development takes place. It is distressing to me to think of what the destruction of natural habitat to trees, flora and fauna will take place and the diverse animal life that frequents and lives in the Peel Yalgra wetlands, especially to Ward Point. I have read the EPA reports and I see there is no further assessment needed. Um, to me, this should be an ongoing assessment. Our back fences that back onto the bush that go down to the estuary um, the impact on the flora and fauna, especially the large amount of bird life that frequents and lives in this bush, would be immensely catastrophic. For example, to the black cockatoos, the sea eagle, the egrets, the magpies, the woolly wagtails, and I'm getting specific, the honey eaters, the wrens, and there's only just a few of the birds, and not to mention the kangaroos, the frogs, the snakes, and possums that live in that area. The Peel Yalgrut wetland Ramsar site includes the largest and most diverse estuarine complex in southwestern Australia. So the site is an important area for water birds and waders in southwestern Australia, regulating, regularly supporting over 20,000 individuals. A large system of shallow estuary and saline, brackish and freshwater lakes that is used by tens of thousands of water birds, including large numbers of migrant shorebirds from the northern hemisphere. The system supports a regionally important estuarine fishery, and this information comes from the Ramsar Site Information Service, which is a national, um, a national Ramsar site. Um, number two, from the from the report, the national, oh, as a matter of national significance, the Tree Survey and Black Cockatoo Habitat Assessment. The following contains a foraging habitat for the cockatoos in this area. It reads. There is a total of 4.12 hectares of foraging habitat on the site. There was a small amount of evidence of forest red tails and carnaby black cockatoos having foraged on Mary and Jarrah nuts on the site. There are 133 trees on the site that meet the definition of breeding habitat due to their trunk diameter. Foraging according to the black cockatoo referral guidelines uh, the clearing of more than one hectare of quality foraging habitat or more than 10 hectares of low quality foraging habitat has a high risk of causing a significant impact and that was in the report. Degradation of more than one hectare of quality habitat by things such as altered hydrology or fire regimes has an uncertain risk. 
The significance of degradation depends on the type of degradation and the quality of the habitat. The site contains 4.12 hectares of foraging habitat for these black cockatoos and clearing more than one hectare has a high chance of resulting in a significant impact. Looking at the clearing of trees on sites decreases the chance over time of these birds' habitats. In one of the council's past interior development orders, um, according to 1.4.3 of the policy, it showed Ward Point to be set to lot sizes of 1,500 metres squared that would be appropriate to the zone. And in paragraph 3.2.3, .3, it says remnant vegetation is an important part of the landscape and for, ma for maintaining the sense of place and the natural heritage of the region, which makes Pleasant Grove. The small area of Sedgeland have very few weeds and are considered to be in very good conditions. There are few weeds, but the overstory has been impacted. The Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, the DBCA, noted that Carnaby black cockatoos and the forest red tails, which are an endangered and vulnerable species under the EPBC Act. The Chewett woodlands and forests of the coastal plain ecological community are critically endangered under the EPBC Act. Um, and lastly, another main concern also is the loss of privacy to increase building heights at the back of our block. Instead of one back neighbour, there would be two or three. And if they decide to build a two-storey house, have big sheds, which we could have two at our back fence, or the house is built up, um, they could look be looking directly into our backyards. On page 54 of the committee report, if our fence is 1.8 metres high, and then the habit, habitable 2.42 uh, metres AHD FFL, you can see from the plan or picture that the infill view would be higher than us. And it says, and I quote, existing trees in the building zone will be removed. We decided to buy here because of the privacy in the bush surroundings, which are lovely. So it does concern us to have these buildings um, at the back of us, plus the added destruction of bushland, including the 100-year-old grass trees, which are many. So thank you for listening to my deputation. Thank you very much for being here this evening and presenting your deputation. Next, the deputation this evening is by Ronald Dorn, representing Ronald and Candace Dorn and Simon Davies speaking in opposition of the officer's recommendation in relation to Pleasant Grove Circle. Mr Dawn. <laughs> Good evening, Reese. Good evening, uh, Mayor Williams and members of the Major City Council. It's not very often I'll come to a uh, council meeting, but obviously this is in my neck of the woods. I live at uh, 15 Branchville Way uh, with my wife, Candice, been there since uh, 2001, um, and also representing uh, Simon Davis, and I should have put his wife's name down, um, who live at 17 Branchfield. So I've got a small uh, spiel, but a lot of my stuff has been uh, taken and I really heartily agree uh, with everybody's presented so far. So I only got four, four minutes now. So thank you for the opportunity to address Amendment 4 to the planning scheme. I come before you to voice deep concerns about the proposed development and its potential impact on our cherished local environment and commu community values. Pleasant Grove Circle has long been distinguished by its large spacious blocks, a hallmark that reflects the vision of creating a serene and expensive, expansive living area. This vision aligns with the broader principles of preserving our region's natural beauty and ecological balance. The proposed amendment to smaller blocks contradicts this foundation principle and, and poses significant risks to both our environment and the quality of life in our community. A primary concern centres on the S3 ecosystem and the last remaining virgin bushland on the island. This area is just not a scenic backdrop, but a vital ecological ha haven, as has been previously discussed, provides a critical habitat for a range of species, including the ospreys, the black cockatoos, the possums that find their way into our roofs, and a variety of native Australian birds. Um, also, the presence of lizards and kangaroos and um, further underscores the richness of this unique environment. The impact of this development on the estuary ecosystem cannot be overstated. The backfill required to elevate the new blocks to a higher level than existing properties will significantly alter the natural topography. Such changes can disrupt natural water flows, increase the risk of erosion and compromise delicate balance that supports local wildlife. The increased land elevation may also affect water quality in the estuary, 
which is crucial for maintaining healthy aquatic eco ecosystems. Moreover, this backfill processes our process risks further encroachment on the nat native bushland, disrupting habitats and displacing the species that call on. The loss of these natural areas would not only diminish biodiversity, but also erode the very essence of what makes the Pleasant Grove area special. Many of you have publicly advocated for respecting and preserving our existing natural and community assets, as evidenced by your statements and initiatives that have been shown on the city's Facebook page. The proposed development flies in the face of, in my opinion, of these principles by undermining the very aspects of our community that you have championed. In light of this, I urge the council to consider long-term implications of this decision. Could we not have the foresight to establish a large area within our community that demonstrates the council's respect for the environment and commitment to preserving it for future generations? Imagine a park-like environment akin to Kings Park in Perth or Central Park in New York. Spaces that have become integral to their city's identities because their forefathers had the vision and initiative to take care of the environment. Such an initiative will be a testament to our dedication to ecological stewardship and a lasting legacy of responsible development. Our community chose Pleasant Grove precisely for its large box and natural surroundings. The proposed change is at odds with the values that attract the many of us to this area. It's not just a matter of aesthetics, it's about preserving the character and ecological integrity of our neighbourhood. I respectfully request that the Council reconsider Amendment 4 with a view to maintaining and enhancing our environmental heritage. Let us seek developmental solutions that align with our collective values and demonstrate a forward thinking commitment to protecting our natural assets. Thank you for our time. John, thank you very much for your thank you. attention. Councillors, isn't it funny? Our former teachers, they'll always be called by their last <laughs> names, no matter no matter how many years has gone by. Um, a lot of years. The next, uh, not that many, thanks very much. Yeah, the, the, next, uh, the next presentation's by uh, Ms. Dixon, uh, speaking in opposition to the officer's recommendation relating to Pleasant Grove Circle. Back. Thank you. Mayor, councillors. Council staff, the public. I do not live in Pleasant Grove, but I live next door in a way. I've my question to this deputation is why are we rezoning it from R5 to R10 and what is the reason? And how much power does the city of Mandra have? with regards to what has all been said and done this evening, with regards to <laughs> keeping the integrity of this location. Um, one of those things, will the public open space, otherwise known as POS, be increased to accommodate for the influx of residential population? And does the city of Mandra have power to do this? We all know this, and this has been said by many people here, removing mature trees is something that is not sustainable on any level, in any fashion. It doesn't make any sense because you cannot replace a mature tree with a two-year-old sapling because it will take at least 80 years, 90 years for that tree to be of any forage value or habitat value for the species that requires that species of tree to live. So I'm not really sure why removing of mature trees is always a, a good decision to make. Um, Ringtail possums, critically endangered Western ringtail possums. Um, I monitor this species, so I can speak of experience and having a very long association with this particular species, is that, yes, we do have them in Wananup, and we have them on the estuary side of Wananup. So I'd probably be really interested in knowing what the fauna assessment and who the fauna assessment person was 
that applied it or if it has been applied. Um, critically endangered species are critically endangered because we put them there. So we put it at that level. So I don't think it's always feasible to start removing vegetation and habitat when species rely heavily on it to live. Um, that's kind of really it other than I'm not against development. I'm against development not done sensitively. Um, you know, developers need to make their money. Um, people need places to live, but not at the cost of, of species that are already in such dire, dire straits because we put them there. So that's all I'm going to say on that because everything has been said by learned people here. Everything has been said. Thank you, Aaron, over there. Appreciate that. Um, but it's not easy. And I don't know how much actual power our Mandra City of Mandra has to change this other than go with, I think it's an LPD. Um, LD. With that, yeah. So I'm not really sure how City Mandra lost the ability to change things. Thank you very much for your deputation. Uh, our final deputation on this item uh, is uh, presented by Caroline Hayes, speaking against the officer's recommendation in relation to Pleasant Grove Circle. Thanks for being here tonight. It's a little bit different to everybody else. I hope um, technology is well. Different is fine as long as it falls within five minutes. Okay. Oh, I hope so. Okay. Right. So I speak, I uh, obviously live in Pleasant Grove, I live in Woodsong um, Close, and I speak with the experience of living in this beautiful area for almost 15 years. We didn't buy into the area for financial gain, quite the opposite, we bought in for the lifestyle and its relationship with nature. Pleasant Grove is a unique area, an oasis on the edge of suburbia. It is a peaceful, spacious and niche environment enriched with na nature and the natural surroundings that can only be found on large blocks. Just on our one acre block, we have possums, a range of different lizards, owls, many different varieties of birds, spiders, snakes, of course, kangaroos, the list is endless. Thanks to the safeguards put in by the council, we have laws that protect these habitats and ecosystems for both native flora and fauna. This proposal is in complete con contrast with the conditions that residents have been nurturing and abiding by for decades. To be told that we must seek permission to prune trees, for example, when just across the road, because of the potential rezoning, developers would now be able to prune, and, but not only prune, but decimate the land, goes against everything that we've been led to believe that the council both stands for and promotes for our area. I wonder why we have had such strict policies in place that can be overturned at the request of a developer. We live in a time where we know that loss of trees is just the start of the deterioration of land, and that all it and all that it possesses never to be replenished birds mammals flora ancient trees lost for future generations of humans animals and vegetation alike when the stake of this proposal is recognized it will be too late to rectify we have an abundance of expertise and professionals living in pleasant grove who have grave concerns about the long-term repercussions of the proposal the proposed smaller blocks have been likened, so I've been told, to being in keeping with Cocoa Bay and Blue Rise Cove. Why? They are not and never have been part of Pleasant Grove. Pleasant Grove residents have no affiliation to the Cocoa Bay Associational facilities. Requests were even made by residents of the area around Blue Rise Cove only a few years ago to block off the road linking both areas due to the amount of traffic. Of the most recent houses built on Blue Rise Cove, on, av on averages of 1,000 square metres, it appears that very few trees have been retained. And the same can be said of the 1,000 square metre blocks developed by the same developer just off Duke Street. If you put aside the slick, well-spoken professional presentation selling this proposal, then that is the evidence-based reality of these smaller blocks. There is no place in Pleasant Grove for smaller blocks because Pleasant Grove is all about being at one with nature and protecting the native environment. I invite all the councillors here making such an important decision about our area to take a walk around Pleasant Grove and experience what it is about and see for yourself what it has to offer and then picture the impact of this proposal. This can't be seen or felt just by looking at a map. We have minimal street lighting, few footpaths, rough roads in places, 
We are semi-rural and dedicated to the preservation of where we live, and that is what the residents are bought into. I have read about the larger blocks not being feasible. I ask feasible to who? They are feasible to the residents who have already invested heavily in the area, feasible to nature, already established there. Do we all count for nothing if the already wealthy developers can't make big dollars? Sorry, team, um, sorry. I can't allow you to make statements okay. that reflect adversely on anyone. I, didn't, I ask you to withdraw that statement. Okay, I withdraw that statement. As a teacher, I teach about sustainability, livability and caring for and protecting our planet. Yet this proposal will put the economic success of a few before the needs and respect of the many. After reading the council's profiles on the City of Mandurah's website, I know that preservation is a common shared philosophy. To quote some of the profiles, unwavering belief in the importance of local representation that truly mirrors the values and needs of the community. Prioritizing preserving Mandurah's unique environmental values, preserving its natural beauty and heritage, protecting local ecosystems, to protect and cherish the natural resources, the natural environment, recognizing their value and the need for their preservation. Believes in responsible, responsible stewardship of our nature, natural environment that considers the needs of current and future residents. There is more. I am therefore you dumbfounded that this, sorry? You have 30 seconds. Can I just say my last sentence? That this has even reached the stage that it has and plead that sanity prevails and this proposal is permanently abandoned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillors, our next deputation this evening is uh, by George Wally in support of the officer's recommendation in relation to the welcome to country and acknowledgement of country policy. Uh, Mr Wally, as many members of the community will know, uh, is an elder in this area and we're very grateful to Mr Wally for being here with us this evening to make his deputation. I'm sure I don't need to tell Mr Wally he has fun. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, councillors and uh, public. Um, I'll read from the sheet and explain a little bit uh, beyond that. As an elder, I'm really pleased to see the proposed changes to the welcome to country and acknowledgement of country policy. It's great to see the city taking steps to respect the tra uh, traditions and protocols of the Binjarab people more clearly and consistently. These updates not only help everyone understand when and how to properly, properly recognise our culture, but they also ensure that the community knows the importance of these practices. By embracing these changes, we're promoting respect and understanding, which helps everyone or bring everyone together and move forward in a, a good way. Um, and if I can just elaborate on that, my, my thing as a teacher, past uh, educator, uh, person who works in the health area and tourism, um, that's been a thing of um, both my generation and uncle's past to uh, bring together a better understanding of, of who we are and how we all fit in together. So my uncles, uh, Joe Wally and uh, Frank Nanup, rest in peace, they were bridge builders. And their, their bigger picture and my bigger picture has been how do we best educate those around us of 50,000 years of the human existence in the southwest of Australia and Western Australia. And sometimes rituals, sometimes a way of um, explaining things um, comes into a, a play or space that helps us do these things. So um, the, the relationship that we have with the city of Mandra, a working relationship, has been very positive. That started with those uncles past. It's actually gone back beyond there over time with the leadership, um, generational leadership over many uh, years ago with Dower. The name, of course, is an Aboriginal name with Billy Dower. Uh, those two uncles who were, like I said, bridge builders, they they had a foresight to um, work with people so that these days, um, through Winjan Aboriginal Corporation, we're able to do the extraordinary things. And the extraordinary things are based on where we come from 
and how we go about uh, those practical things in in respecting our culture, respecting, um, like I said, the 50,000 years of people being here, and also how we want to move forward as uh, One Australia in having a better understanding. So I guess in, in saying that, it's, it's uh, really moving for me to, to speak these things, and there's so much more to, to speak on, you know, within five minutes. There's so much more to, um, as an educator, to uh, educate our younger generations, which we do through incursions and excursions. Um, I recently had my song, Want You My Friend, which is saying hello and greetings, sung at the Sydney Opera House um, two Mondays ago. And that's what I'm saying, that where there's respect shown to um, people and our culture and being uh, responsible ourselves for doing better as well, these opportunities are there for us all to uh, grab and to, um, to move forward. I've always said that as One Australia, we need to learn from each other. Uh, and they, these are ways that we can learn from each other, the little things, because the bigger picture is far uh, broader and it's far more respectful. And it's not just the city of Manja uh, in that working relationship, it's many agencies and departments many different local governments um, that are doing similar things. So I, I just want to say thank you to the City of Manja um, uh, for, for what you're doing. Thank you. Mr. Ali, thank you very much. And thank you for your service to this community. Uh, we immensely appreciate it. The next deputation is by Linda Christie in relation to the Western Foreshore Development Proposal, speaking against the officer's recommendation. I welcome Christy to the deputation. As indicated, you have five minutes. Please don't be offended. I'll remind you at one minute that you've got I think I should be good. I hope. Uh, good evening, Mayor, councillors, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to express my opinion on why my family think the proposed Western Foreshore development should not go ahead. At first, some of you already know me or have received my emails. For those that don't know who I am, my name is Linda Christie. We have been residents of Weatherly Place since 1994. And as you can imagine, we've witnessed a lot of development. Stage two had not started yet. And when we first moved into our house, we could still hear it, the cows mooing in the paddock on Sutton Farm, just on the other side of Mary Street from our front door. Since then, the Shell fuel station has been replaced by the current and very handy strip mall. Stage two, three, et cetera, of the Port Manager Canals have been developed, as well as new bridges. It is a beautiful and welcoming area, and we love living here. I believe every one of you knows how lucky we are to have such a large, valuable park in the middle of our city. Why are we wanting to throw away this precious gift that sits in such a prominent place in our city? Just throw it away. As you know, Hall Park is well utilized with a playground area the skate park area, and the swimming area. Every morning, afternoon, and evening, residents and the holiday makers exercise, walk their dog, or simply stroll through the park. Given the recent City of Mandra strategic community plan, Hall Park is the perfect example of how the City of Mandra can meet its community priorities. Regarding environmental sustainability alone, it should be a priority to preserve the natural environment of Hall Park it should be a priority to protect the natural environment of Hull Park. It should be a priority to educate our young ones on the importance of how Hull Park should be preserved and protected for future generations. It does not matter what walk of life you come from, Hull Park is and should remain forever public, green, open space for all people of all abilities and all age groups. We need to preserve, protect, and maintain Hall Park so that our future generations have the same opportunities to enjoy Hall Park as everyone in this room has the privilege to enjoy now. Do you not have a problem with the environmental impacts of having a brewery, distillery, refinery on the bank of our river? Seriously, are we considering converting Class A Crown Reserve into an overflow parking lot? 
The fact that we all have Hall Park already a Class A Crown Whistler should be preserved and cherished forever. Having Hall Park a public green open space provides for all families of all ages and all abilities to enjoy. For example, New Year fireworks, Crab Fest and the circus, Maca Cancer 200 Ride for Perkins, this fantastic cycle ride and fundraising event has raised a lot of money for cancer. The Christmas motorcycle ride, dropping off Christmas gifts for those not so fortunate. The skateboard competitions attract a lot of families and hopefully encourage other youngsters to have a go. Vintage car meets or other displays that require the space to show whatever their club or organization want to put on display. Let's leave Hall Park as it is, green, public, open space. With our beautiful war memorial, it is a perfect space to reflect on the wonderful life we now we have now because of those men and women that gave up so much for our country. In conclusion, please vote against this very divisive proposal to change the vesting and keep Hall Park as the jewel in Mandra's crown. Thank you. Thank you very much for your deputation. The next deputation is by Anu Karapa, who's a member of the city's youth advisory group. This is a group of young people that advise council directly on matters that are relevant to young people. And uh, Anu this evening is speaking on behalf of that advisory group, speaking in support of the officer's recommendation. Thank you for being here uh, and thanks for your service to the youth advisory group. And uh, you've got five minutes. Good evening. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we're meeting this evening, the Binjara people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Anu Kurupu and today I am representing the City of Mandurah's Youth Advisory Group. I'm here to share our collective perspective on the proposed redevelopment of the Western Foreshore. On the 5th of June, the Youth Advisory Group was consulted on the Western Foreshore Leisure Precinct and Commercial Site Business Plan. After consideration and discussion, the members of the Youth Advisory Group had some feedback on the proposed plan, which we'd like to share with you today. Overall, the YAG appreciates the vision proposed by the Western Foreshore redevelopment. In particular, the, VA the YAG supports the versatility of the space in terms of its recreational and commercial potential. Young people in Mandra are in seeking employment and training opportunities now more than ever. And we believe that the new businesses established through the redevelopment project will bring such opportunities for us. In particular, hospitality jobs will be a major source of new employment in the area, which the YAG further encourages and supports. The members believe that this development brings the energy and atmosphere that Mandra needs to stand out, especially amongst young people and appreciates the plans for an active recreation area that will undoubtedly enhance the livability of the city. In particular, additions such as volleyball, pickleball will be attractive for young people to engage with and enjoy with their friends and family. The Youth Advisory Group has also highlighted their enthusiasm for the 18-hole mini golf course, as this will be a great addition to recreational opportunities for Mandra families. We also appreciate the addition of a chocolate factory. Comments were made on considering the potential to add a boat ramp to the area south of the bridge as an addition to the current plan. The addition of a microbrewery was received generally well by members as a place where families can go for a nice meal together. Uh, but the YAG have also commented that a small play area within the brewery would be appreciated, especially for families with younger children, as the outside playground um, outlined in the plan would be too far away for children to go by themselves. Members have also emphasized that they would like to see some integrated and interactive artworks in the area. This could be, for example, augmented and or physical artwork around the foreshore to commemorate important landmarks and tell the story of the city. Members also believe that having a dispersed artworks around the area can greatly improve the foot traffic along the western foreshore from restaurants to the skate parks and bridge and so forth. The potential addition of such augmented reality artworks were proposed, which could be accessed by scanning codes that are placed around key art pieces, waterways such as bridges and jetties, and also footpaths and other landmarks. The augmented art that would essentially come to life through the screen could possibly be downloaded and shared, uh, which can also enhance the city's publicity. Furthermore, artwork can be used to visualize and explain how the area has changed over time and also express the significance of the area to the local community. There were further suggestions for increasing interactivity and foot traffic in the area, 
such as including a form of scavenger hunt with specific landmarks. Finally, the inclusion of exploratory artworks, such as tiny doors, which have previously been used in Mandra, were proposed to make the foreshore more unique and also explorable. To finish off, the Youth Advisory Group appreciates and supports the plan for the redevelopment of the West End foreshore, as we believe it will be a great space for young people and youth. We're looking forward to exploring this place, the space after its completion. To the mayor, deputy mayor and councillors, we appreciate you for giving us the time to share our perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much for your deputation and on behalf of council, please um, our gratitude, pass on our gratitude to members of the advisory group for their um, advice to council. Our next deputation this evening is by Richard Beitmanis, and I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name, representing Richard and Aileen, speaking in opposition to the officer's recommendation in relation to the Western Foreshore redevelopment. Welcome. Thanks very much for being here tonight. Good evening to all. Thank you for the opportunity. This will be uh, short and sweet. Um, as a ratepayer of 30 years, I am strongly against the suggestion of, of a boutique brewery on the Western Foreshore. My concern would be for the future effect on our marine life and waterways. Getting, getting uh, to um, uh, Mary Street and the overpass, um, we, we avoid crossing the bridge because of all traffic from, from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. and evening. Developing this reserve would be a, f a, f a, few, a further congestion and inconvenience to the, most of the residents. I, I would be in favour of improving the existing carnival, in carnival, um, maybe a cafe, a, a mini golf, and even a larger Ferris wheel, which would be a, a great attraction, I feel, because they have, a, have them all over the world and they, have, they are really successful. The reserve is, is constantly used, in use with people walking, exercising. Then we have the circus recreation events, food vans, charity for charity. Increased parking will intrude on nearby residents, totally unacceptable. In conclusion, we seem to be living with our town consistently under construction. Improvement, yes, but overdevelopment, taking this true identity of Mandra away. Please leave our Western Foreshore alone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your deputation. Really appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, the, the next deputation is presented by uh, Mr. Alan Kranzberg, um, speaking uh, in relation to the Western Foreshore in support of the officer's recommendation. Mr. Kranzberg is unable to be at the meeting this evening, but he has uh, provided his deputation to me in writing and as per the standing orders, I'm required to read it out. Confirming this is Mr. Kranzberg's deputation. I'd like to add my support for the redevelopment of the Western Foreshore in the interest of transparency. I'm also a member of the City of Mandra's Strategic Economic Advisory Group. I'm a long-term member, resident having, of Mandra, having purchased a property in stage one of the canal development in 1998. I've seen Mandra grow and think the proposed facility will make much better use of the land with the proposed kids' play area, licensed restaurant, the chocolate factory, and mini golf, far better than a very underutilised and under-maintained King Carnival. I think it gives the people of Mandra and visitors to Mandra a wonderful place to enjoy our city and the amenity of the waterways. Also note that the park where the development is proposed is some 68,000 square metres and the facility will only use up to, to 9,000 square metres, of which the majority is the mini golf. I regularly visit the park and it is very underutilised. I, like some of my neighbours, want to see a traffic management and parking plan that ensure those people who have property in the area are not inconvenienced and can continue to enjoy the greater access to those who are not lucky enough to live in the vicinity and would be a great attraction in Mandra in, in making foreshore areas more accessible and inviting to all of Mandra's people or the many visitors we get. And I understand that the proposed development will bring much needed jobs and income into the town, which is badly needed. I like the fact that visitors to the park have access to the existing facilities, such as the skate park, the adventure area, and the existing foreshore and jetties. The new facility will complement these existing facilities, and I hope 
will continue to focus on a theme of family friendly place to go with kids young and old. I appreciate that the licensed premises will have to close by 10 p.m. as that fits with the family friendly family friendly theme. There are enough places where people can go after 10 p.m. already in Mandra uh, that are not so family friendly. While the council will be subject to many inputs, both for and against the development, I hope they look at the proposal positively while putting in place boundaries that focus on a family friendly, accessible area that does not unduly inconvenience local residents. Please can you pass this request on. The next deputation is by Mr. Jim Booker speaking in opposition to the officer's recommendation. Mr. Booker is the current president of the Port Mandurah Ratepayers Association. Uh, and so um, we welcome you here and acknowledge the Port Mandra Rate Hayes Association as an important stakeholder in Mandra. Thank you for being here. Good evening. Thank you, Mr Mayor and councillors and public and employees. Um, I had prepared quite a few documents and I've emailed them to you in the past. Um, I'm sure you've all received those. What I'm about to re reiterate tonight is basically the same thing. But my main concern and main concern of the PMRA is the traffic um, situation, which we find very difficult to resolve in any way that we've looked at it. I know option one is touted as being um, the preferred option. However, I would really like you to explain how a right, which is, I'll explain option one, a dedicated left turn lane from Mary Street into Pinjarra Road together with a right turn straight through lane. And what, what does that look like? I was. I'd like to bring in a map today and have you explain to me how that's going to work in reality with 60 to 100 cars an hour trying to do that right turn into Leighton Place. Um, I think it's an impossible situation that cannot, without major roadworks, I'm talking flyover bridges or some tunnelling or something, be resolved. It will be a traffic nightmare for uh, anyone coming down Mary Street, Anyone wishing to turn into the brewery will be um, impeded by the traffic in Mary Street. Anyone turning right into the brewery will then have to wait and that traffic will back up over the roundabout, round the roundabout, over the bridge. If they're coming from Perth or if they're coming from the south, it will be, um, they'll be occluded from getting into the round. It's, it's a, uh, <clears throat> a non-resolvable problem without major roadworks and that hasn't been factored in. I think the claim was that it will be considered, uh, planning hasn't been commenced, but it will be considered 2028 and 2029. Those are five years away. It's, it, will, it will cause significant heartache and frustration to anybody living south of that roundabout. Another point is the substantial loss of public green space in the in the uh, Paul Park, in spite of the six, sorry, the eight thousand metres that's being allocated or proposed to be allocated, there is an extra four thousand square metres allocated to parking space. Plus, I imagine there would be another area would be allocated to accessing those parking spaces. So there's an extra four thousand square metres which will not be available for usage. It'll be car park. Um, the other, the other, another point was the incompatibility of a 650 seat super pub, which is really what it is going to be, um, a brewery restaurant complex within 100 metres of established residence. The noise will be um, a factor, and I know we've spoken, I've spoken to uh, the CEO. Um, she claims that noise will be abated by the building structure and it can be looked at but the noise will be a problem it's already a problem the noise coming across the river at night um, i used to live in carter street and the noise was effective there um, some of the members living in the pre immediate precinct the noise is effective already from the from the businesses uh one minute <laughs> i'd better get on with a little bit more then Um, one little aspect that I did find did find today was the uh, petitioning, and there are six hundred and three petitioners 
that have signed and been approved or recognised. Um, and I do know that you do have a number of businesses that have, have agreed to or promoted this business, this uh, enterprise, but they, you can count them on one hand. 603 petitioners have to be factored in as an individual. 603 individuals say, no thanks. The other, the other point I was going to raise was the, was the uh, comparison with the Port Kennedy development where um, they're claiming 180,000 people visiting a year. It's, a, it's almost an identical size development and the Port Manager one is claiming 750,000 individuals a year. There's a, a huge disparity there. Um, the cost of the Port Kennedy venture is 13 million. The cost of the Port Mandra venture is for an identical, in fact, a lesser building is 23 million. There's a huge disparity in that costing. Um, I'd like to hope that the council wasn't just mesmerized by that large figure. I don't think it's valid. Um, the ongoing jobs is the X, X one. Port Kennedy claims there will be 35 ongoing jobs. The manager claims there will be 293 plus 145 ongoing jobs. Port, Port Kennedy is the same venue claiming 35 ongoing jobs. Mandra venue is claiming 292, seven times or eight times more. Um, it just seems incongruent. I'd like everybody to review that in the future before you make a decision. It, it certainly doesn't need to be done tonight, but it needs to be done. Review that that's, that structure. How am I going with time? I've uh, allowed you 40 seconds over, Mr. Booker, thank you very given much your here. status as the president. But thank you very much for being here this evening. And, and I apologise uh, for the um, stuttery voice, but it's, it's a very dear and near problem to me. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, our next deputation is presented by uh, Mr. Ryan Mosney, um, who's uh, the deputy chair of the Visit Mandra organisation, um, Mandra's tourism entity. Uh, presenting Mr. Mosney's deputation this evening is the general manager of Visit Mandra, Anita Kang. Ms. Kang, welcome to the meeting, and we uh, would love to hear Mr. Mosney's deputation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillors. Um, unfortunately, Ryan couldn't be with us this evening as he's on a flight um, home, but he very much wanted to. Um, our support for the Western Foreshore Leisure Precinct development. On behalf of the Visit Mandra Board of Directors to confirm our unanimous support for the Western Foreshore Leisure, Leisure Precinct development. Mandra is truly one of Western Australia's gems, known for its stunning waterways and vibrant atmosphere. We believe the city has a fantastic opportunity ahead with the proposed commercial site, which has the potential to become a standout addition to our destination. The proposed development isn't just about adding commercial space. It's about creating a vibrant and engaging space on a key waterfront site that is currently underutilized. Additionally, the site complements the existing fam family-friendly offerings nearby and promises to become an important part of Mandra's tourism experience. As a tourism destination in a highly competitive market, it is essential for us to keep evolving and enhancing the breadth of experiences and attractions to ensure we stay competitive, relevant and appealing. Currently, 83% of visitors to Western Australia are from within this state and they are seeking family-friendly experiences and diverse dining options. These statistics highlight the need to cater specifically to these visitor preferences to maintain and grow the overall appeal of the destination. The way visitors experience Mandra has a huge impact on how they view the destination. Positive experiences are crucial. They shape the reputation and brand and encourage visitors to return and extend their stays. We firmly believe that this development will significantly contribute to creating those positive experiences, enhancing how visitors perceive Mandra and their overall enjoyment of the destination. The anticipated influx of visitors will not only boost our local economy, but also generate substantial economic returns across the entire tourism industry. The increased visitation will drive revenue for local hotels, restaurants and attractions, 
And this in turn will create a ripple effect that supports jobs and stimulates further investment in our community. Thank you for considering our support for this important development in Mandra, which we believe will play a significant role in cementing our reputation as a premier tourism destination in Western Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kane, and, and please pass on our thanks to Mr. Mosney for his deputation. The next uh, speaker is Ms. Irene Harrop, uh, representing herself, speaking in opposition to the officer's recommendation regarding the Western Port. Uh, welcome to the meeting tonight. Thank you for being here, and uh, we appreciate your deputation. Five minutes. Let me see. I don't know what. Uh, good evening. I'm Irene Harrop, a long-time resident of Maintra and member of the Port Maintra Ratepayers Association. Quite some months before the start of the canal development, King's Carnival moved uh, from near the Atrium Hotel uh, to the Western Foreshore and was granted a 20 to 25 years lease. Then the consensus was that at the end of this lease, Hall Park and A-Class Reserve would revert back to its original state. <clears throat> 36 years have passed since then, and climate change can no longer be denied. The population has grown, and land for housing has become very expensive. More and more people will be living in apartments, therefore, it is vitally important uh, that our city planners and administrators will not sell our green spaces for short-term gain, but have the welfare of future generations at heart. We cannot afford to lose habitats for bird life by cutting down well-established shade-providing trees, nor the destruction of wide stretches of lawn which are mitigating against heat and floods, only, only for more concreted areas. We are in need of good public transport, not more car parks, which become mere furnaces during our hot summers. I consider the Western Forest Develop Development Proposal to be short-sighted. It will also it will also harm, be harmful to the businesses on the eastern foreshore. Moreover, it will deprive future generations of a green sanctuary within walking distance of their homes and city, making Mantra less attractive and livable. Parks close to a city serve as refuge from the vagaries of life. Its citizens and visitors find solace and recreation there, so necessary for emotional and psychological health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your deputation. Our next deputation is presented by Mr. Shane Sutton, speaking in support of the officer's recommendation. Mr. Sutton, thanks for being here this evening. You have five minutes. Good evening, councillors. I'm actually here to give you a history lesson, nothing less. The property we're talking about was in the family for a couple hundred years, 150 years until it was made an A-class reserve. Now, you've got to understand the shire out on the board, I looked there, it had the uh, Mandra Roads Board. It was actually the Murray Roads Board, of which my uncle was on for three years. That was Hal Sutton, Henry Sutton. Henry was one of the instigators that split the Shire. So he thought that Mandra was a very good tourist area and Pinjarra would be a great agricultural area. We owe and him he could see that. So then he got on the Shire here when it started. He was on from 1960 to 1971 and Shire president from 60 to 69. During that time, the land over there in 1959 was all that was just a sandford flat, not a tree on it. It was dredged up from the middle of the river. The original title was to the low water mark. So as it got dredged up, we got to own more land. He, in his hindsight, 
did not sell the land to the Shire. It was sold as an A-class reserve. The reason being, and this is what our family believes, and my cousin Peter, was that the Shire could never sell it. It would always be for the people of Mandra. But one thing I'd like all the people here to know, my father and uncle were both proactive in believing Mandra was a tourist destination and it should be providing places for tourists to come. My personal look at it, it employs people and it will be good for the environment. What was there before was just a Sanford flat. Dirt, if you look at a picture in 1959, there was actually nothing there. So the way the family looks at it, um, we quite like the idea, the program. The Western Forge was wonderful. I walk on it every day of the week. I walk my dog around the park. So I'm one of the few people here that actually uses it a lot more. I live within 300 metres of this new facility that's going to be built. So as historian, but make a good choice. You now, you cancellors have got something to really think about. Make a very good choice. Thank you. Mr Sutton, thank you. And uh, we also just acknowledge the contribution that your family have made to this city over a long period of time, um, and particularly that represented on, on the on the town of Mandra and the Shire of Mandra at that time. Mm -hmm. A very good decision uh, made to split Mandra and Murray. Sorry to our colleagues in Murray who are probably watching this recording. Uh, we're now going to go to our final deputation for this evening, uh, Mr. Jason Hutchins, speaking in opposition to the officer's recommendation in relation to Western Foreshore. Mr. Hutchins, thank you for being here this evening. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, Jason Hutchins, I'm actually a resident manager for 20 odd years or so. Hospitality business owner for free venues on Mandra Terrace. I'm not speaking against the venue or competition. I'm just speaking against the location. Um, the city has quite a lot of land on Mandra Terrace. Why aren't we looking at a um, place that over there? Why are we giving away free land? And we could use the land on the Mandra Terrace side. Mandra Terrace is sort of the hub. We're spending $9 million on the foreshore at the moment of redevelopment. And we're now moving something over the other side of the road. To uh, to build, which attracts the distracts away from the um the Mandra Terrace. Ah, lost where I mapped it now. <laughs> so my question is, is it ethical or reasonable for the city to enter into a lease agreement to earn income from free land? Is it even legal? Like I said, the city owns quite a lot of land on Mandra Terrace. Would that be an option for this venue to be built? That way the council can receive rents from land that we actually already own as ratepayers and as councillors if proper appropriate rezoning was applied to that block of land. As a business owner as well, um, and most, most people know with free old land, you've got to pay rates and taxes and stuff like that along the way. Again, free land over there no rates and taxes but if i was to build a business or rebuild again on private free old land i'd have to pay rate and taxes there'd be no free ride also have to pay the mortgage on my loan etc over the years the council have been concerned about the survival of mandra terrace and now the council want to support a developer financially by upgrading car parks jetties road upgrades and a freeze for two years or more, or roughly two years, on payments on rates, rates, etc. Compared to most developments, like I said, still need to pay all those costs along the way as they build their business to even open to operate. The figures that have been quoted seem unrealistic. If they're achievable, that's great. But an extra four, sorry, an extra 750,000 visitors per year divided into 365 days equals 2,054 visitors per day. And a 650 seat brewery. An extra $30 million in revenue would equate to $40 per person that the 750,000 people a year that are going to bring in. 
If my business turns over, say, $3 million, and their estimates $30 million, that's 10 times more than our current figures. An extra 750,000 750, people with little to no public transport in that area, you'd presume most would drive. How will the current intersection and road cope with this extra traffic? The jobs, again quoted, 292 jobs directly. Currently, it is very hard to get, employ get people to come to work in Mandra. Many venues are looking for chefs, wait staff, bar staff, managers, supervisors. This is not new, it's always been here. On top of that, the extra 292 employees, where are they going to live? We don't have, we don't have rent. We don't have places for people to live. This employment are going to come directly from the venues already around, all the hospitality venues. We're not going to attract 292 more employees. They're going to be taken from other venues. Shelter have a very similar situation in Bustle at the moment, where people are just job hopping from venue to venue. They also quote 145 indirect jobs. What does that mean? Does that mean it's the delivery drivers bringing the chips and the meat, et cetera, in? I don't understand that one either. A $23 million development employing 292 employees. Like someone mentioned already, the recent advertisement of the Port Kennedy Brewery, similar size and style, quoting roughly $15 million in development and 35 full-time employees. They also quote that they're going to support the local TAFE facilities. The current hospitality venues in Mandra already doing that. It's nothing new. The big issue, parking. The council are going to build a new, good new car parking spaces. Mr. Hutton, that, that is your time. Um, I'll give you 10 seconds no, to wrap up. I've got about five, 10 minutes, not even 10 seconds to go. <laughs> All right, they're talking about new car parking spaces. There's 179 existing parking bays already. They're going to create another 202 parking bays increasing the parking bays on the Western Falls short of 381 for one business. I guess there's roughly 400 bays in Mandra Terrace, only 400 for all the street there. Yes, there's over 2,000 around the other suburbs, around the, the CBD, but there's only a small percentage in the, in the CBD itself. Council estimate that they're going to spend in one to five years on parking, yeah, jetty, intersections, seconds upgrading to new capital expense, that the council would spend roughly $5.9 million in five years. Council have been quoted they're going to get revenue from the lease options of $6.2 million over 25 years. Sorry, Jason, I'm going to have to stop. Saving $700,000 on a market lease if they went to market lease. Thank you very much. Just about finished. No, sorry, that's the end of your deputation. I've given you a minute over, which is more right. than generous. I appreciate your deputation this evening. Thank you very much. Councillors, that concludes the deputations this evening. Uh, we'll now move to the next item, the confirmation of minutes. Could I ask for a mover and a second uh, that the meeting of the minutes of the meeting 23rd of July be confirmed? Councillor Rogers, seconded Councillor Shoemaker. Is there anyone opposed? Motion's carried. The declarations of interest now. Councillors are reminded of their obligations to declare any uh, interests that they may have in relation to the meeting. CEO has received a number. CEO. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to uh, raise a number of declarations of interest for the planning item relating to amendment number four, lot 801 Pleasant Grove Circle. Um, Councillor Peter Jackson has a financial interest as the um, developer is a director of a company that um, Councillor Jackson works for and he will leave the room when that is being debated and decided. Just to clarify for people, that's the local radio station. Uh, uh, Councillor Daniel Wilkins has an impartiality interest um, due to knowing the Bassett Scar family through their long history in Mandra. Uh, Deputy Mayor Caroline Knight has a impartiality interest as she is a member of the West Australian Planning Commission Statutory Planning Committee. Councillor Bob Pond has a impartiality interest through being uh, an employer, employee of the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation. And DWA have provided comments on the amendment, which Councillor Bob Pond had no involvement in. Councillor Amber Kearns and Councillor Ahmed Zalani 
have a impartiality interest as they know the Bassett Scarf family through their long history in Mandra. Councillor Ahmed Zalani in relation to report one, two and three, as and that's an impartiality interest as his son was the chair of the Youth Advisory Group and they provided their comments on the above reports. Councillor uh, Mayor Reese williams uh, for report number seven, the review of local emergency management arrangements and its impartiality interest through being the deputy chair of the State Emergency Management Committee. Councillor Amber Kearns in confidential report number two, uh, an impartiality interest through uh, friendship of the uh, Chief Executive Officer Performance and Remuneration Review. And I also have a financial interest in relation to report two um, as a report, report relates to my conditions in my employment contract. Thank you, CEO. I'll remind councillors of their obligations in relation to their declarations of interest. Those with a financial interest or proximity will need to leave the chamber immediately prior to the item being discussed. I will remind you at that point. We'll now move to questions from elected members, which notice has been given. Uh, there is a question from Councillor Burns. Councillor Burns. Thank you, Chair. Can the CEO or relevant city employee provide an update on the permanent sandbars passing project status and whether any further progress has been made? My second question is, understanding that it has been an extremely busy period for the CEO and her team, can the CEO please provide an update on the permanent sand bypassing project community presentation that was planned for August, as stated in a previous council meeting response? Uh, thank you, Councillor Burns. I'll direct the question to the CEO. I'll direct the question to the Director of Built and Natural. Uh, through the Mayor, and thank you for the question. The permanent sand bypassing investigation report was completed in early 2024. Uh, subsequently, a funding submission uh, was made to the Australian Government and the outcome of this application is expected um, by December of this year. Uh, city officers are also presently working with the Department of Transport to progress the further technical studies uh, that are required to inform uh, the design uh, of the permanent sand bypassing system. Um, in respect to the second question, the community information session is now planned uh, for late September and something should come out uh, to elected members in the community around confirming that date very shortly. Uh, this has been postponed uh, primarily due to the extensive community engagement process uh, that has been undertaken in relation to the Western uh, Foreshore uh, throughout July and August. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that response and Councillor Burns for giving the question in advance. Um, are there any questions to the meeting, Councillor Schumacher? Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, to the relevant officer, could I please, uh, or could we please have an update on the um, Netball Association and where we're at with the new courts? Thank you. I'll direct the question to the CEO. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have, uh, we're still going through the Russian Park Master Plan, and that will be presented to Council uh, through a workshop, hopefully by the end of the month. And we are, are working with the state government in relation to identifying um, the location of netball in the long term. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. A subsequent, a subsequent question on the same issue uh, through the chair. Um, is it uh, through that I believe that a the city of Mandra is making a uh, funding request for the upcoming state and federal governments? Oh, sorry, elections. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. I'll take the question. The um, uh, the regional netball facility is a um, project included in the city's advocacy strategy. Are there any other questions to the meeting? There be none, no, nor any business left over from previous meetings. We'll move into recommendations of the committee. For members of the public's benefit and to remind members of the council, uh, there are several committees of council. When those committees meet, uh, items of the committees uh, are discussed and recommendations by those committees are made to this meeting by the full council. Um, the two committees that Council has that have met over the course of the month are the Audit and Risk Committee and the Planning and Community Consultation uh, meeting. Members of the Council will now be invited to withdraw items that they wish to discuss uh, that were put forward at either one of those committees. Any items that aren't brought forward and discussed at this Council meeting, I'll be asking for a mover and a seconder to carry on block. The uh, item in relation to Pleasant Grove is withdrawn as a result of additional information being provided in the agenda, which was the comment from the Mandra Environmental Advisory Group. 
Are there any other items that any other councillor wishes to withdraw from either the Audit and Risk Committee meeting or the Planning and Community Information Committee? There be none. I'll ask for a mover and a second of that all other items be carried on block. Moved Councillor Rogers, seconded Councillor Wilkins. Is there anyone opposed? Those items are carried. We'll be dealing with the Pleasant Grove item now. Yes, apologies. Uh, we'll be moving now with the uh, Pleasant Grove item. Before doing so, can I just do a roll call um, to check, Councillor Kearns, that you're still online? Yes, I'm still online. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Councillor Kearns, um, just a reminder to you um, that um, when asking members to indicate their vote, I'll be asking uh, for uh, those in favour of the motion. I'll then uh, seek for you to advise whether you are either for or against, and then I'll be seeking those opposed before declaring the item. Uh, can I confirm that you understand? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'll deal with the Pleasant Grove item first. Is there a mover for the item? Councillor Pond, I'll second the motion. Councillor Pond. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I understand very well that the residents of Pleasant Grove are not in favour of this um, proposal. Um, fundamentally, I don't like it in many ways either. I'd like to see the foreshores left alone. But many, I mean, the option to not develop the land is not before us at this point. It's the extent at which the land is developed. Um, if council was to um, decline um, the proposal as it stands in front of us, I would go before the WAPC, um, Western Australian Planning Commission, to avoid the acronyms, um, and uh, I guess I trust the outcomes of that process more than then we might achieve following the um, officer's recommendations. Um, so, yeah, I support the resolute or the recommendation as they stand. The officer's recommendation will set a minimum lot or a minimum lot size of one thousand square meters, but it will um, require an average of thirteen hundred square meters. It will require sewage. One of the problems of the existing subdivision in the area is that it's not on sewer, um, and that poses a threat to the estuary itself. Um, I think there will be a, a um, within the planning framework recommended, there will be a tree retention plan, an environmental plan, management plan, and a foreshore management plan that will go a long way to addressing many of the concerns raised tonight. Granted, there will be further clearing. Um, but the requirement of the local development plan will give the city control, some control over tree loss and tree damage um, through not only the design of the subdivision, but will allow the careful placement of building envelopes for both main residences and any outbuildings, the management of fill, variations in setbacks to ensure that that identified trees are retained and protected to the maximum they are able to within the proposal. Um, and yeah, and very importantly, that the recommendations will require the local development plan and the foreshore management plan to come back to council for agreement on it. Um, and I guess, like I say, ultimately, I prefer what I think we will be able to do with those mechanisms than leaving it up to the WAPC to take care of those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pond. Um, and uh, I echo your comments. Um, I understand that the residents are um, sad about this development going ahead. And I have to say um, that many of the concerns that are raised in the deputations I share. But the reality is, uh, as was raised in the deputation by Ms. Dixon, we aren't making a decision tonight. What we are doing is providing a recommendation to the state planning body that makes the decision. And what is absolutely critical, and many of the deputations councillors spoke to the credentials and the passions and the interests in the environment that members of this council have. What we have had to do on balance is make an assessment as to how to get the best outcome that we can, not the perfect outcome. Now, people may well shake their head, but 
if council makes a decision that isn't in line with the state's planning framework and seeks to add conditions that then allow us to be able to have some control over the outcome, then this will look fundamentally different. What we understand, and we have experts in this field and we are experienced in planning matters at this council, what we understand is if we draw, if we put our heads in the sand and say, no, we're not considering an amendment that complies with the city, with the state planning framework, then what we will end up with is a rezoning that will allow for a minimum block size of 875 uh, square metres with absolutely no uh, capacity to moderate or um, address tree retention through what the mechanisms of the local development plan allow us to do. And so whilst it will feel good for us to sit around the chamber and say, well, yeah, well we, we, you know, we didn't support that amendment, the, the absolute reality is in every way the Planning Commission will. And so there is no way to be able to go back and retain this land as it currently is. And we sit here in our quasi-judicial role as planning officers to make the best decision that we can within the planning framework. On that basis, I recognise our staff and I recognise the landowner and those members of the community who have had their say, because what we have been able to achieve, despite the fact that all of us would appreciate no development on the area at all, what we have been able to achieve is a minimum lot size of 1,000 instead of a minimum lot size of 880, a average lot size of 1,300, and the ability to control where the lots are, instead of a uniformed development, control where the lots are so that we can retain the vast majority of the trees. In addition to that, we have the option of better managing the foreshore reserve as a result of this, these conditions that we've built in. So I would ask residents that are opposed to this, we could make a decision tonight to not proceed with the amendment, and we would be sitting here in five years' time saying, isn't it a shame there's now 113 lots that have been built there at 880 square metres, and if the council hadn't have stuck their hand up and said, we will show our leadership and find a way to get an outcome, then that's what we would result in. So I would encourage council to support this, and I would say to the residents, we know what we're doing in the planning space. There is no benefit to the city of Mandra for larger, smaller, for smaller lots. There is no benefit to us. What we are doing is making a decision that will ensure the best outcome that we can seek to achieve within the controls that we have. And I would encourage council to support it. Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, there is public participation is um, complete. I'm sorry, ma'am. Now we have two options here. Either I can ask you to sit down or I can ask you to leave the chamber. I'd like for you to stay. Public participation has completed. Are there any questions by councillors? Yes, Councillor Smith. Uh, questions through the Mayor to the relevant officer. I have three questions. In the instance that the West Australian Planning Commission adopts the Council's recommendation tonight, should this motion pass, can an officer comment on anticipated community involvement in the establishment of the local development plans or the LDP? Confirmation that Council endorsement for the final LDP will be required? Question two, should this motion pass, will a city officer make a deputation to the West Australian Planning Commission to emphasise the importance of the conditions recommended by council, and in particular, the minimum lot size, the minimum average lot size, and the very, very strong importance of the requirements for the LPD, L LDP? And question three, in the instance that the West Australian Planning Commission does not adopt council's recommendation amended conditions, but proceeds with the rezoning to R10, how will the city officers approach ensuring the concerns of the community are addressed through the subdivision process? Thank you. I'll direct the questions. Uh, thank you, Councillor, for the question and through you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> with respect to the first question um, that relates to uh, should the motion, should uh, the uh, LDPs and the public participation, the city will advertise proposed uh, proposed LDPs to the landowners in the vicinity of Pleasant Grove during this assessment of any LDPs. Any submissions would therefore be considered as part of the assessment process. 
and presented to Council to inform the final decision. Uh, to confirm the Council's endorsement for the final uh, LDP would be required. Item number four uh, does um, point, point to the requirement that LDPs are to be determined by Council. To uh, respond to question number two regarding a deputation to the West Australian Planning Commission, uh, following consideration by Council, the City will submit uh, uh, all relevant documentation to the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage. This includes the officer's report, council minutes, and the proponent's technical information. In relation to the presentation to the WAPC, whilst it is considered to be common practice, at the it is at the discretion of the WAPC, the, w the City will strongly advocate for the opportunity to make a deputation to the WAPC, where, in response to question three, during a deputation um, to the planning community, uh, the, the, the proponent commit. Oh, sorry. During uh, their deputation at the planning and committee community consultation committee, the proponent committed to following through with the preparation of the foreshore management plan and LDPs, and offered to provide, provide a written undertaking in the event that the WAPC don't apply those provisions through to the um, to the scheme amendment. Uh, and that's it for those questions. Thank you. Councillor Smith, any other questions? Um, I'd like to, I wish to amend a motion. Yes, Councillor um, Smith. Um, if you read the amendment and then I'll get a second. Certainly. Um, I wish to amend a motion to add an additional point. So making it point seven, the amendment is as follows. Require a City of Mandra officer to make a deputation to the West Australian Planning Commission to emphasise the importance of the conditions recommended by Council and in particular the minimum lot size, minimum average lot size and the requirement for a local development plan. I thank you all second to that. Um, I feel it's quite a self-explanatory amendment, ensures our best chance of demonstrating to the decision make makers at the West Australian Planning Commission the importance of the conditions that we're recommending regarding this extremely unique development. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any speakers against the amendment? I'll put the amendment. Those in favour? Councillor Kearns? I'm in favour. Those opposed? The amendment is carried. The, amendment, the amended motion is now the substantive motion. Is there anyone wishing to speak against the motion? There being no speakers against, uh, Councillor Pond, do you wish to close? Um. Yes. Sorry, Councillor Pond, before asking to close, um, any questions? Sorry, Councillor Wilkins, no problem. Um, uh, just, uh, sorry if I missed it, and to the relevant officer, did we get an answer to the lady's question about the liability of the front flood risk? And if not, can we just get an answer to that one? There please? was a response made, but I'll refer the question to the CEO. As st uh, through you, Mayor, as stated before, uh, we are not to comment around insurance and, pers and private property. Thank you very much, Councillor. Any other questions, Councillor Rogers? Uh, just a quick one in relation to something that was raised through the presentations that we've received um, in the deputation uh, about the management of building waste. Uh, just wondering if a question of clarity in relation to the controls that are in, uh, available to the city to prevent spread of building waste uh, and uh, the similar controls that can compel clean up. Um, if I could get a response from the relevant officer, Mayor. Thank you. I'll direct the question to Mr. Ingle. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to, I'm not uh, familiar with that exact location, but it's, I think it's important to note that individual building sites are the responsibility of builders themselves. Um, so normally our approach would be to, um, if we receive complaint, um, we would go and assess the building site. And if there's obvious um, waste management and um, building site management issues, then we will take action through the issuance of notices or infringements. Um, for the poor um, management of the sites. Um, we also do have a proactive program of monitoring building sites um, to try and improve um, building site management practices. Um, and that, that if we're in a location that has a higher amount of building, we would do that as we've been doing in um, south of the cart and also um, within the Lakelands and Medora Bay areas. Thank you, Mr. Ingle. Subsequent question, Councillor Rogers. And just a subsequent question to probably the same um, officer. Would it be fair to say that um, uh, as and when residents become aware of issues that they immediately make them aware to the city uh, and that then action can be taken. Thank you, Mr. Ingle. 
Yes, through you, uh, Mr Mayor, that is a very important thing that um, uh, residents do report to us because we can respond quite quickly through our ranger team or compliance team to assess those building sites. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Councillor Pond. Councillor Wittsawani, yes. Um, can, can I request, may I request you to allow a couple minutes to that lady who will stand up to tell something? No, sorry. Because I want to take the you. informed decision. I appreciate it, Councillor Zalani, but the motion is live and there is no possibility for public participation within the meeting. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you, through the Chair. Just a question in relation to the endangered flora and fauna that we, we know uh, that we have in the Peel region and, and the whole southwest. What occurs if there are ringtail possums found on on the site and canopies etc cetera, etc cetera. What, what what would occur then to the subdivision thank you councillor schumacher i'll direct the question to mr lucas thank you for the question uh through you mr mayor there's a number of measures in place uh that that fall into line at future stages through the subdivision <coughs> or um development uh prior to those occurring there's a there'll be a requirement uh, for an environmental management plan, which will include inspections of all vegetation on site um, and a, a fauna management plan will be a part of that fauna, how they manage the fauna and relocation. Um, in addition to that, the Commonwealth requirements under the EPBC Act um, sit parallel to this. They, they're not something that the city um, enforces or is terribly involved in, but we do remind the developers of their obligations. And in this case, I understand the, the developer has actually commenced the um, referral process under the EPB C Act to that to that agency. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Thank you. I'll uh, invite Councillor Pond to close. Um, yeah, just to close once again, I understand that this is not the outcome that people were coming here or our deputations wanted, um, but. I do believe that the measures that we put in place with the uh, the recommendation and the amended recommendation um, give us our best chance of getting the best outcome on that site. So apologies, but thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pond. I'll put the motion. Those in favour of the motion? Councillor Kearns? I'm in favour of the motion. Those opposed? Councillor Zalani is opposed. The motion's carried. Uh, we'll move now to the next item, which is the uh, first report uh, of the evening, the first CEO's report, which is in relation to the Western Foreshore. I'll move the motion. Is there a seconder for the motion? Councillor Wright has seconded the motion. I'll just take a moment. Councillors, I want to begin um, uh, before speaking to the item to acknowledge the staff that have been involved in preparing the report, um, the work that's been undertaken to manage that level of community consultation um, is significant and, and therefore I, I really acknowledge and thank the staff for their work um, both in dealing with that consultation and also in bringing the proposal together. I'm not intending to speak to the specifics of the uh, report this evening. You've got a very exhaustive uh, uh, report in front of you. And of course, we've had a number of uh, presentations and briefings on the item. So we know uh, the item well, we're very familiar with it. But I just want to take a step back for a moment and think about this, um, this proposal in the context of uh, the strategic direction that the city's hoping to achieve. And we welcome back the Deputy Mayor and uh, Councillor Jackson. As we know, as we talk about a lot in this place, city building is a competitive business. We're in the business of building cities and it's competitive. And one of the reasons that Mandra has been successful is the community and decision makers that have sat in these chairs over a period of time have uh, had the courage to be bold and have had a clear vision for the city's future and have carefully balanced the desires of the community today with that vision for its future. And that's really critical. I think that this proposal and I hope that you all agree, um, is another step forward in that balanced ambition. So I'd you know, pre present to you tonight um, to give some consideration to that. 
the council supports this tonight, as was mentioned in the report. So this would mark the single biggest private investment into the city centre in decades. Uh, it's a considerable development that creates a number of jobs that's been outlined in the report, uh, not to mention creates an attractive outcome for local people and, of course, for tourists as well. The chocolate factory, the mini golf, uh, the inflatable water park, which is part of the next phase, of course, the a restaurant and microbrewery and the cafe, all part of this precinct sitting alongside uh, what is an upgrade uh, to this public area if the Western Foreshore Leisure Precinct that we're dealing with next and the Waterways Master Plan are supported, unlocking millions of dollars of, of investment into these areas to create something that's really visionary and really iconic. And so I would really encourage us to look at the merits of the entirety of the project. There's been a lot said about some of the granular detail in relation to the parking, in relation to the traffic particularly, which I agree uh, needs further analysis. In relation to the trading hours, certainly in relation to inundation risks as uh, we see sea level rise. But as always, we take that proper and orderly planning principle and we apply that through the planning process. So tonight we're not making a decision about the planning process. We're not making a decision about the parking. We're not making a decision about any of those things. We're making a decision tonight at a strategic level as to whether or not this fits with our direction that we believe that the city is heading on behalf of those ratepayers that we represent. And there's been a lot of feedback. More than 1,000 people feeding into this specific process and more than 3,500 people that have been involved in having input into this waterfront revitalisation, this journey that we started in 2018. It's worth reflecting on that journey for a second. So state government, federal government and local government investment into the transformation of the waterfront because the community told us that it was important. A new skate park, a new playground, the estuary pool, upgrades to the eastern foreshore. This is the final piece in this puzzle. This overview of the western foreshore, the transformation of this site is the final piece in this. And no one is arguing that this is in an iconic site and that we as the custodians of that site need to treat it carefully. But we aren't paving this site as a car park, as was put in some of the comments made earlier. There is an increase in parking. There is a need to increase the parking now. And so that's, a, that's a, an appropriate planning consideration. But there's also other factors to consider. In the next item, we're going to be dealing with an immense level of upgrade to this site that can't happen unless the commercial aspect goes ahead. And so it's really important that we recognise that. I would really encourage us to take that zoom out moment. We've got the data within the report that gives us an overview of the possibilities in relation to dealing with the concerns that have been raised. And you know, I give my commitment, and I know the CEO gives hers, that if the proposal is successful, that we'll be working alongside all stakeholders, including the Port Mandra Residents Association, to address any of those concerns through the planning process. But the question that we're being asked tonight is, do we believe that this is the right project in line with our vision for Mandra? And in my view, the answer is yes. I want to repeat to you that city building is competitive. And if we're not moving ahead, then we're going backwards. And what it means when we're going backwards is that our residents have less opportunity. So making a decision that provides a significant number of jobs, that adds a key attraction to our tourism offering and provides a great aspect for locals to be able to enjoy is a really worthwhile project. And I really believe the, the time is right, having now completed the waterfront transformation in almost its entirety, for us to finish this final piece of the puzzle. I know that we all and the people that have spoken tonight agree that Mandra is a great place to live. It always has been and it is today. But we also know that Mandra is a place of unmet potential. We haven't got the best out of this place yet. And while this proposal doesn't finish that piece off, it certainly gives us another step forward in re reaching the city's immense potential. And I believe that that's an obligation that we have as decision makers at this time. I'll come to the second, Councillor Wright. Thank you, Mayor, and through the, through the Mayor. And thank you also to everyone who's participated in the public submission and the city officers who have put so much time and effort into this piece of work, it's substantial. The Left Coast Leisure Group's development is a long-term strategic investment in Mandra's future, and it's expected to create 174 construction jobs over 400 ongoing jobs when it opens. This is significant. This is projected to significantly boost our local economy, injecting 29 million in the first six years, along with an annual $30 million tourist spend. These figures represent a sustained positive impact on employment and business growth within Mandurah. 
With a projection of 750,000 visitors annually, this project can only enhance Mandra's appeal as a tourism destination. The mix of hospitality, recreation, and unique development opportunities, such as the mini golf and the microbrewery, will not only draw locals, but also the interstate and international tourists alike. It fosters long-term growth in tourism and its associated industries. As we've heard from, I know from the YAG group earlier today, it's also just not about the economic benefit to shelter, but also the community enrichment that comes with it. The opportunities that currently other Mandra businesses also access through South Metropolitan TAFE uh, with the Mandra hub for work placements, work experience and graduate opportunities. Make sure that we're training up our next generation and as she mentioned tonight, the opportunities that comes with that for employment for our youngest members of our society, it is quite visionary in its nature. Strategically, the development prioritises environmental sustainability by maximising the tree retention and ensuring that there's still a direct line of sight through that water, to the water. It ensures a project integrates seamlessly with the Western foreshore Preserving Mandurah's natural beauty while also enhancing our urban vibrancy. Over the first 25 year term, the projected rent generates approximately $6 million in revenue for the city. Additionally, all rates, taxes and outgoings are paid by the sublease. The city plans to reinvest the revenue in ongoing maintenance to ensure that its suitability to this ongoing tourism opportunity remains. I do note the traffic management concern, but I note within the report that the CEO's commitment to bring something before council June next year is most appreciated. And we've certainly had a bit of uh, input from uh, the Director of Built and Natural Environment already. Look, finally, from me, I see this as an opportunity for strong strategic community leadership. As the Mayor's mentioned, the amount of money that's already is proposed to be investment is substantial. I believe that successful councils make decisions on where they want to be in X amount of years ahead. I believe this development aligns with Mandra's long-term vision for sustainable growth and enhancing the Western Foreshore as a vibrant, inclusive and economically prosperous place. This is an investment in Mandra's future, driving visitation, creating opportunities and ensuring the city continues to thrive for generations to come. So I would implore that my fellow councillors approve. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Is there any speakers against the motion? Councillor Burns. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to speak on this important matter. I can confidently say that this is one of the most significant issues I've faced in my nearly three years on Council. Over the past several months, I've deliberated on this matter with great care and thorough consideration. I thank the residents and business owners who have reached out to share their carefully considered and respectful views. I'm speaking now to voice my strong opposition to the proposed commercial development on the Western Foreshore an A-class reserve here in Mandra. The gravity of this decision extends far beyond the present. It is a choice that will have generational significance, shaping the character and community values of our city for decades to come. We must carefully consider the long-term impact of future residents and to ensure we are preserving something truly valuable for them. This location is not just another piece of real estate. It is a world-class prime waterfront property with direct access to the shores of our beautiful estuary. It is effectively the beating heart of our city, a national treasure that connects the coastal city centre with surrounding natural beauty. This land was originally classed as public open space, a place where all residents and visitors, regardless of background, could come together, enjoy and find peace. For the past 30 years, a commercial business has operated on this site, a reality that should never have been approved in the first place. Now we are faced with a decision to either continue down this path of commercialisation or to honour the original intent of this space as a public gathering place. Approving this land for commercial use will effectively deny residents and visitors alike the opportunity to enjoy this public space in a social, inclusive manner. Families should have the freedom to picnic, sit and relax in a peaceful environment, taking in the serene views of the waterway, far removed from the busy, noisy traffic of Mandra Terrace which is adjacent to the Eastern Foreshore. Aboriginal families whose ancestors have enjoyed this land for thousands of years deserve to continue this tradition. So do the families of recent immigrants who often gather in large groups to celebrate community and culture, much like we see all around Australia. 
Furthermore, it is not the role of government to subsidise or favour certain commercial operators over others, especially when these businesses will be in direct competition to established private land on the eastern foreshore. The government should not be in the business of picking winners and losers. It is unfair and creates an uneven playing field, undermining the very principles of free and competitive market. In my opinion, it goes against the strategy of revitalising central Mandurah. Moreover, the community has raised legitimate concerns about this proposal, including the risk of antisocial behaviour, increased noise and local traffic issues. These concerns should not be dismissed lightly. We have a duty to listen to our constituents and consider the impact of this development could have on their quality of life. As a town ward councillor, I'm deeply connected and networked within my ward, which I've proudly called home for over 40 years. I'm a strong supporter of the ward system, which allows for focused representation, and I know that our community overwhelmingly supports this system. This proposal falls within town ward and is based both on my personal engagement with residents and formal public feedback received. It is clear that the majority of town ward residents oppose this development. Their voices must be heard and respected in this decision-making process. While some argue that the revenue generated from this commercial venture offset expenditures of parking and roadworks, it's crucial to remember that these expenditures are already part of our core service delivery. Our rates are better spent on maintaining and improving public amenities and infrastructure, which benefit the entire community rather than diverting funds to discretionary areas. In conclusion, I urge my fellow councillors to consider the long-term impacts of this decision. This is more than a decision for the present. It is a choice that will shape Mandra's character and community values for decades. Let us prioritise the needs and desires of our community over short-term financial gain. By making thoughtful choices today, we can preserve this beautiful public space for all to enjoy now and for generations to come and focus our resources on services that truly enhance the community. Finally, I foreshadow a motion which I will present should this motion be lost. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Burns. Are there any speakers for the motion? Councillor, uh, yes, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Look, I am speaking in favour of the officer's recommendation to authorise the Mayor and the CEO to proceed with the proposed major land transaction and enter into a sublease with Left Coast Leisure Group. Our community have been expressing their vision and desires for the waterfront from as far back as 2018. And it was these views for activation and family-friendly spaces that shaped the criteria that we used by council in 2021 when it went out as required to seek expressions of interest for the commercial site. Back in November, 2022, council selected Left Coast Leisure Group as the preferred, preferred proponent, uh, with its restaurants, microbrewery, mini golf, chocolate factory, and cafe, which all directly aligned with our community's expressed vision for the, for the area. So yes, I am very excited by this proposal, which will deliver to our community high quality spaces for relaxation and, re and recreation, which they have asked us to deliver. The financial model, as outlined in the report, is sound and will ensure that the lease monies will be used to enhance and enrich the Western Foreshore Precinct. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the over 1,000 people who have provided comment for their, for their time and their input. Community have identified issues that need to be finessed, and I want to reassure people that while they do not form part of the proposed land trans transaction, they are incredibly important and will be comprehensively addressed by the at the planning stage. The traffic intersection, parking, hours of operation, coastal erosion and noise are all dealt with at the development application stage. It is absolutely essential for the residents and the applicant that, these, that the amenity of the area is not negatively impacted and that a thorough planning process will need to occur to address these issues. So, councillors, I urge you to support the recommendation so that we can continue to deliver to our community, providing high quality spaces in the city for all. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Speakers against the motion, Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, thank you, through the chair. I'm not going to talk about what has been discussed at the moment through, and with my fellow councillors and uh, with the ratepayers and predominantly town ward residents who I'm happy to say I also am the, an elected member for. 
those ones being, as we know, the traffic, the noise, um, all that stuff. What I'm going to do is concentrate on the public submission period. But first, I, I wish to ask a question before I carry on. Um, to, the, to the relevant officer, in, in the documents we have got, there is a numbers or reference to pop-up engagements, which represent 252 yes votes, five, sorry, glasses required, five neutral, 21 against. When did those pop-up engagements take place? And did those pop-up engagements uh, have the major land transaction and the precinct plan in the reports on display for people to comment on. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. I'll direct and the I will continue after that. I'll direct the question to the CEO. Through the CEO to the Director of Business Services. Uh, thank you. Through the Mayor, I'll answer the questions as they've said. Uh, in relation to the pop up um, sessions, the pop up consultation sessions, the attachment uh, to the council report outlines the dates in which we held those sessions. Uh, we held them on Tuesday the 16th of July at the mark from 9 to 11 a.m. Wednesday the 17th of July again at the mark from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. Wednesday the 17th of July at the Horsehead Shopping Centre on the 18th of July at the mark from 4 to 6 p.m. On the 20th of July at Thompson Street Netball Courts from 8.30 a.m. to 11 a.m on the 22nd of July at the Mark from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m., on the 23rd of July at the Mark from 4 to 6 p.m., and on the 26th of July at the Mandra Senior Centre. Uh, we can confirm that at all of those pop-up sessions, the major land transaction commercial site business plan was made available for the community. Thank you to the Director of Business Services, Councillor Schumacher. I, I thank the Director for all those answers. First and foremost, with the pop-ups, I. I take that the pop-up figures with a grain of salt. I'm not doubting that they happened. However, what I am doubting is that people would have taken the time to go through the major land transaction or both documents fully. People just didn't, wouldn't have that time. God knows it took me a long time to go through. So I'm going to deal with the official public submission period. This is the one that I have said from word go. Well, I was actually encouraged people through social media, through community pages, to have their say, to read both reports in full, and whether for or against or indifferent, please make comment. Because I am here with regards to this and the um, precinct plan to represent not just the town ward, as I should because they are the ones that have elected me four times, but also Mandra as a whole. And if we look at if we look at what we received from the public, if we take emails, now the emails we don't have broken up, unfortunately it's not the way it was set up into the uh, precinct plan or the major business transaction. But we had 82 received. 64 said no, 12 said yes. Now, the neutrals, I don't need to comment because it's six. If we look at letters of support, there were 13 received, eight said yes, two said no. And if we go to the Mandra Matters site, the commercial proposal from the town ward, 63% said no, 37% said yes. Whereas for the whole of Mandra, it was a total of 234 submissions, 99 said yes, 133 said no. So the overwhelming majority here is no. We don't want this. I, I have, um, I wish I will finish off shortly, 
but I do have a um, foreshadowed motion should this motion be lost and would can I read this out now? Yes. Okay, the foreshadowed motion should the, the recommendation that we're dealing with now debating uh, not win is that Council 1 receives A, the Western Foreshore Commercial Site Major trans Land Transaction Business Plan contained in Attachment 1.1. 1 .1. B, the Community Engagement Report, Western Foreshore Leisure Precinct and Commercial Site Major Land Transaction Business Plan contained in Attachment 1.2. C, public submissions made on the Western Foreshore Major Land Transaction Business Plan Plan contained in attachment 1.3. D, City of Mandra comments on the submission themes in attachment 1.4. And E, the key indicative terms in attachment 1.5. Item two, having considered the public submissions, do not proceed with the major land transaction as proposed in the Western Foreshore Commercial Site Major Land Transaction Business Plan as per attachment 1.1. And three, requests the Chief Executive Officer to write to Left Coast Leisure Group Proprietary Limited, thanking them for their time in pre presenting their proposal. That is my foreshadowed motion. And I wish to just finish with one thing, which is actually in the report that we have got, and it's on the agenda. And it states, Class A reserves afford the greatest de degree of protection for reserves of Crown land created under the Land Administration Act of 1997. The A classification is used solely to protect areas of high conservation or high community value. Thank you. Thank you. Speakers for the motion. There be no speakers for Councillor Jackson speaking for the motion. Um, okay, I've got some friends. I'm nearly 60 this year. I've got some friends I love catching up with, and they tell me about the days when they were considerably younger. They used to ride on the bonnet of their ute around what is now sort of green fields in an area, shooting possums. Um, that was the mandra they grew up in. And um, I really love hearing those stories. They're, they're, they're great. But, gee, you couldn't do that today. Um, and when I think about the way Mandra has grown, where uh, there have been kind of significant moments along the way that we look back now and go, gee, what was that all about? Um, I remember former Mayor Paddy Creevy telling me once about um, how passionate they were and 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 um, the fight against the radio station that I work for putting up a mast um, in the back of the, the yard so that they could transmit to the FM receiver. And she said, oh, you know, I don't understand what we were going on about. But it was a pivotal moment in change. It, it meant that Mandra was now going to be different. Remember other stories too I've heard from other people um, like when the bowling club moved out of town, way out into the Watts um, on Anstruther Road, which was out of town. Um, and that was a really big deal for the bowling club. Now, the bowling club is not even there anymore. It's moved um, further up the road. But I remember hearing from one of the old timers about the controversy that was, and it nearly divided the club. There were nearly fights. You know, you, you, why are you moving it way out there? Um, stories like when the forum was was being built, there was a um, I think it was driving driving movie theater there for a while. Um, the controversy and the impact on what's that going to do to the center of our town, and it's going to destroy us, and businesses will go broke, and and there was an impact, and it did shift the focus of Mandra away from what we now call the entertainment precinct, which is this area we're talking about here. Um, but I don't really know too many people that think twice about going to the forum now or think about, gee, we've ruined our town. 
but it really did mark a moment where from there on in matter was different it wasn't wasn't the mandra that you know we we know and feel comfortable with and and so there's an element of fear about that unknown we're moving into a new season or new era and what if oh gosh we might be wrecking something here and so with this uh submission with the both of them um i kind of feel like we're we were at one of those moments and um although this feels like a moment in time and we've taken the pulse if you like with these surveys um our job is not to do math and say well that many for that against so therefore okay i mean we can get a calculator to do that that's not what we're here for um that's a little pulse check for right now but this process has been going on for well 12 years that i know about and i've been involved in it for for that period of time where um, we didn't just say oh well look you know there's a gap over there what can we fill it with we looked at our our city um, and our people as a whole and said well what do we need what's what's missing what what, what are the problems and we um, are often hearing about what the problems are um, and some of them are huge, and, we, and we're tempted to say, well, that's state government's problem. Well, that's, we shouldn't be having to fix that, or what's that? But, but we are the people with um, some measure of authority. Um, and because of that, we have the ability to do something. You know? um, so in this process, what we've done is way back well, 10, 12 years ago, um, the process began with how can we fix what we see is wrong? But set ourselves up to grow, and the projections there were huge back then, and we've grown since then. But back in the days when my friends talk about, you know, we were we were bursting at the seam at like twenty three thousand or something. You know? So that was a challenge for for the long time is here. Um, we're at another one of those points. So we've invested significant money on the foreshore because. The research that we did back then and over this period of time has told us that the future um, for Mandra, where we need to have employment, we need to have income, um, we're in the context of a, a wider area and what's happening in, outside of that area. And we've had all those conversations and done the research, paid some pretty big money to get some pretty good research and brought that back around this table and said, well, okay, that's... That's the context. So what can we do? What are we, what's the responsible thing for us to do, given that we've got a short tenure here around this table and we want to, we want to, to make an influence for, for the good? Um, we were told that tourism really is going to be the future lifeblood of this area in the context of where everyone else around us is going. So we made a, a concerted effort and decision to start to shape our investment in that way. And we have invested significant money, time, resources, and, and meetings, um, both public and non-public, in discussing how we can best do that. All of that has led to what we've done on the foreshore, what we intend to do in the city, what we've done on this end of the foreshore, and what we will do over there. Um, for the greater good, not just for now, but we're talking for the next 20, 30, 40 years. And this is one of those times where it's, we've come right up to the precipice of a big decision that means we'll never be the same again. Shall we do it? And I think in the future, when we look back, as scary as it seems right now, we're probably going to say to ourselves, oh, I don't know what we're really that worried about. It, it's, it's gone okay. And, and there'll be other decisions that we make that will be then scary as we grow and grow and grow and prosper, which is what we want. I feel really comfortable with the process that we've been through. Yes, it is a scary decision because it's a big one. And I've been awake many nights leading up to this, just thinking about it, the 3am thoughts. But courage is also what's needed to go against what is sometimes a very passionate view that people hold that might be contrary to, to yours. But around this table, we not only have that pulse check, those responses, we also have the context that we've built in doing this journey for the last 
well, it's been 12 years for me um, and um, significant years for others as well. So I'm very comfortable with this and um, I urge my fellow councillors to have courage um, because we, we're called here to be leaders. And if we didn't need leadership... Sorry, I'm going to ask members of the public to come. If we you didn't need that. leadership, then the community would, would go where it would want, uh, irrespective of being here. So in uh, acknowledgement of the value that you hold as a decision maker around this table, I urge you to vote for this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Speakers against. Councillor Zalani. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As a councillor living in this district on a daily basis, I understand the community's, community sentiment on this issue. Over the past few months, I have received countless phone calls, emails, and text messages from residents who are deeply upset about this development. As their elected representative, it is my duty to echo their voices tonight, which is why I am opposing the officer's recommendation. We all know that the Western Foreshore is a high value area in an iconic location, and it, and it is the prime, only prime spot left for development. It holds immense potential, but we must remember that a brewery is not a desirable option for our community. Mandra already has many breweries. We should not allocate our prime, last prime location to yet another brewery, which is simply not suitable for the area. The site is near the water, and in my opinion, it should be featured something water-related, such as a water park or a similar attraction. Mandra's real estate value is currently increasing at an optimal pace. In the next 10 to 15 years, our population will grow significantly, and Mandra will no longer be the hidden jewel. People will recognize the value of Mandra, and that day is coming. Therefore, we should not settle for less. I understand that rejecting this proposal tonight might delay development by five to 10 years, but I believe that is better than opting for a brewery. Why should we rush to develop everything now? We should leave something for future generations. Once a brewery is built, we will be stuck with it forever. Furthermore, this is an A-class reserve, a public recreational area. Public spaces should, be, should remain freely accessible to the public. If we lease this land to a private enterprise, whether it is a brewery, a golf course or a chocolate factory, it will no longer be freely accessible. Additionally, the lack of competition could lead to a monopoly, something the council should not endorse, particularly on public property. Moreover, the public will lose the multi-million dollar view of the water because the brewery will block it. This is entirely unacceptable. When considering public submissions, I will not take into account the results from the pop-up engagements. We don't know who the participants are, where they live, and there is only one relevant question with a simple yes or no answer. My biggest concern is that over 80% of pop-up engagement participants took less than two minutes to complete the survey. This suggests, that, this suggests they participate without fully understanding the impact. It is easier to answer yes rather than no, especially when the question is, I quote, do you support the plan for the proposed development of a restaurant and microbrewery, 18 whole mini golf course and cafe and chocolate factory on the Western foreshore? End quote. These explain why 252 residents responded with yes and only 21 with no. For this reason, I will only consider the results from emails, letters of support, and submission through Mandra Matters. 
these participants took the time to read the documents, understand the long-term impacts, and submit their opinions thoughtfully. These results clearly show that the majority of residents do not support this development. I also want to emphasize the submission from the Port Mandra Ratepayers Association, which opposes the proposal. The association represents 1,500 members across 800 households in that area, and 80% of their members are against the development. Finally, I strongly believe that once King Carnival is removed, the best course of action is to return the area to public open space for the benefit of the community. We don't need to spend a lot of ratepayers' money because there isn't much additional work required. This space can be used as a family-friendly recreation area, hosting large events such as circuses, annual cycling events, and city events like craft festival and jig day, et cetera. Additionally, the city is already spending millions of ratepayers' money redeveloping the Eastern Foreshore. We should be encouraging visitors to that area and supporting existing businesses in the Eastern Foreshore instead of promoting a new commercial venue on the Western Foreshore. In conclusion, we are here to represent the residents who elected us. We must listen to their concerns. If we don't, they have the power to replace us when the time comes. As a counselor, I'm committed to serving the community. That is why tonight I will vote against the officer's recommendations and I urge my colleagues to do the, to do the same. Thank you all. Thank you. Are there any councillors wishing to speak for the motion? Councillor Pond. Um, there's been a number of things that have come up that um, I'll never be able to say quite as eloquently as my uh, colleague, uh, Peter. Um, but I do need to, to raise some issues, I guess. One, I think just going for the written submissions is the way has been done by the colleagues on my right um, have, and just taking an entire submission into a yes or no, people were raising issues. In the item previously regarding Pleasant Grove, people raised issues, they were against something, but we saw ways that we could mitigate those and um, move forward. Many of the issues that have been raised over and over and over, such as traffic, such as parking, um, can be mitigated against as a development is considered more fully and move forward. So it, that needs to be taken into account, just simplifying numbers um, in terms of numbers. And again, I don't want to just simplify it all, but I think the pop-ups tell us an awful lot too, because those are people not necessarily with vested interests in the area, but to my take in talking to a lot of people within my ward, that um, that's, I, I see a lot of support for this within the community when I go talking to people. And I think, to dismiss the pop-ups is doing a lot of other people in Mandra a disservice who, yeah, they're, they're not, uh, again, the people in Pleasant Grove wrote in a, about saving Pleasant Grove. The people on the other side of Old Coast Road, who probably like that foreshore area the way it is, didn't write in. It's not their backyard. Speaking of not the backyard, that's, the, the parcel of land we're talking about is not just a um, local reserve at the end of the street. Yes, it plays in part that role, but it is a, a central regional reserve for the benefit of all of Mandra as a crown reserve. It's for the benefit of all Western Australians and all Australians. Um, 
having commercial developments within parks in this state. We don't need to look well outside um, Western Australia, but Fraser's and the cafe next door to it and Kings Park are an example of this sort of thing in a park. All of the Elizabeth Key is a commercial development within a reserve. So I think some of the arguments there, I really wonder about why we would build a water park that was mentioned by one of my colleagues right next to water. That one's always baffled me. Um, and a, another point that uh, seems to get missed in amongst, again, this is one of the ones that gets raised that that park supports the circuses and the ride to conquer cancer and that sort of thing. Well, within the planning that we're dealing with in the next item, all those functions are, are built into the broader plan, the master plan for the park, um, all of which need parking. When we have a, a, a circus now, everybody's parking a, across the, the lawn. Um, so car parks are going to be needed in that reserve no matter what happens. Um, so, yeah, I, and I, I have to say it, um, that the argument that people have the power to replace us, yes, we're elected members. People will replace us along the way. That should not be the basis for decision-making today. Anyway, I will rest my case there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pond. Any speakers against the motion? Councillor Cumberworth. This is a, a very difficult decision as the extended uh, time period of this meeting dictates. I have, as each day goes by, my decisions have changed uh, left and right about this um, motion to change a class A reserve of the highest conservation and community value to a commercial area. And the other day, I was stuck in traffic at the corner of Lake Place and Mary Street in Gridlock. And I sat there in my car and I looked across to King's Carnival. And I had quite a bit of time to sit there and ponder as I was stuck in traffic. And I realised that if King's Carnival wasn't there, I would have this fantastic sight line and I would be able to see right across to the Manor Performing Arts Centre and I'd be able to see right across to the pen uh, and it would, it would open up this massive vista of the estuary. <coughs> I realised that the King's Carnival should have been removed from the site long, long ago. I felt like we've ended up in this position because instead of rightly kicking King's Carnival off our Class A reserve, we've let them stay and let them stay and let them stay and we've decided, well, what are we going to replace them with? And we've sort of come down this path to the point where we've become accustomed to it being a commercial precinct when it is not. And I'll throw back to another visual visualisation. I was down on the Western Foreshore and I was gazing upon the families there. And I realised these are the families that don't take their children where there's a candy shop. They don't take their children where there's anything to purchase. They take their children to a place that's calm and quiet. There is no commercial area because there's no money to spend. They're not enjoying the waterways from the back of their boat. They're not enjoying the waterways from the balcony of their waterfront apartment house or cafe. They take their picnic, they sit on their towels and they enjoy the shade of a tree and some green grass. And as our city grows, having that beautiful waterfront grassed area with an unmolested sandy beach will become so priceless. And later on in the reports, the Waterways Master Plan says, we will try and retain the sandy beach on the Western Foreshore as much as possible. But if we do a massive commercial development right on the shoreline, which will take up a much larger footprint than the current King's Carnival, we'll be obligated to protect those buildings 
and potentially reduce the sandy beaches less and less and less. And I look at the old photographs of Mandra back in the early days when people used to park their cars on the eastern foreshore and slowly but surely we are losing that natural connection to the water. The eastern foreshore is a beautiful little tucked away quiet little corner. You can go over and sit by the war memorial and it's a really sacred quiet spot and for me it's a very simple decision because it's a class A reserve and if this was a uh, nature reserve that had cockatoos or possums, we would never consider um, changing that to a commercial precinct. Uh, and somehow I think we've been distracted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cumberworth. Any speakers for the motion? Speakers for the motion, I will close. Um, Councillors, I want to acknowledge the respectful way in which the debate's been conducted, first of all, um, and I think many valid points across the board, so thank you for that. And um, I do reiterate my gratitude to the members of the public who have had their say and provided feedback into relation to this. Look, a couple of key points that I think is really important that came out throughout the debate, which I think you know, I wanted to clarify. And this is a 68,000 square metre site, and 8,000 square metres of it is for where we're uh, suggesting should be for a commercial development. 68,000 square metres is plenty of opportunity for families to come and enjoy, to have picnics, um, to spend time with their families, um, to be on the beachfront and all of those comments that are made. So um, I don't think that it's true to suggest that we're taking that away by proceeding with this development. If anything, our capacity to enhance that precinct as a result of what we're anticipating will be the result here um, is a favourable outcome. Um, we're not building this thing on the shoreline. That's not what the proposal is. There's deliberately been a, a setback that ensures that the waterfronts remain um, the place for the public. And if that wasn't the proposal, I wouldn't be supporting this because I don't ever believe that you should privatise uh, the beachfront. There is a setback that enables uh, us to retain that public access up and down the foreshores. In relation to the community consultation, this is not a polling exercise. Um, the community consultation is one input. There are many others. And in the expression of interest process that we undertook to seek, uh, with Council's support, uh, a relevant tenant on this site, and every one of the proposals that came forward to us included the provision of a food and beverage offering. So clearly the market is saying to us, uh, appropriateness of a commercial outcome on the site must include a commercial offering, uh, a, a hospitality offering of some kind. Finally, can I say, you know, this is not a binary decision. The next item that we're going to be dealing with in relation to the Western Foreshore Ledger Precinct enables us to achieve most of what's been raised in the deputations. It does. We're not picking a winner here. This is not an arrangement where we're going to market to offer favourable terms. We're entering a commercial lease that will actually see over the first period of that lease a higher than commercial return delivered back to the council. So, you know, let's not make sweeping statements that suggest that somehow we picked someone and said, here, yeah, have this space for free. They'll be paying rates, they'll be paying fees and charges, and they'll be paying a lease that over the period of the loan is higher than what the commercial lease would be. I think we need to keep some perspective here. We're making a decision that is in the best interest of the entire community, both today and into the future. We've received the information before us and now put the motion to this. I'm now going to ask for those in favour of the motion. Councillor Kearns. Councillor Kearns. <laughs> Councillor Kearns, uh, your microphone is muted. <coughs> okay, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to adjourn the meeting. Um, uh, so I'll adjourn the meeting for two minutes to enable us to contact Councillor Kearns. If within two minutes we aren't able to contact her, I will recommence the meeting.
very sorry about that. Oh, it's just like being on a game show, you know, we're we'll back after the break for the results. Uh, can I once again uh, put the motion? Those in favour? Okay, so you can't hear a blind. Um, so I don't think you can hear Councillor Kearns? She, she can't hear, I'm sorry, we've lost connection with Councillor Kearns. You could do that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Councillor Kearns, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Councillor Kearns, how do you vote? How do you vote? Councillor Kearns is in favour of the motion. Those opposed? Councillor Schumacher, Councillor Zalani, Councillor Cumberworth and Councillor Burns is opposed. The motion is carried. <laughs> Uh, the next item of business, thank, thank you to members of the public. The next item of business, councillors, is the Western Foreshore Leisure Precinct. I'm sorry, but I hope we have the opportunity to address the issues with the online attendance. Um, can I ask for a mover and a seconder for the officer's recommendation? Uh, moved uh, Councillor Wilkins, uh, seconded Councillor Cumberworth, Councillor Wilkins. Allow some time for the party. No, you can keep going. Please proceed, Councillor Wilkins. Um, Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as a father of two children who love spending time on the Western Foreshore, <coughs> be, it, be it hours spent at the playground or kicking a soccer ball on Hall Park, I'm incredibly excited about the possibility to transform this amazing space into a family-friendly leisure precinct. One that will not only attract thousands of visitors, but more importantly, see this valuable community space become more accessible to everyone to enjoy. As highlighted, as highlighted through the Mandra Matters consultation, where the community said they are wanting something fresh and new that will invigorate the space. And I think this ambitious, ambitious Western Foreshore Lizard Precinct master plan delivers on those expectations from our community. It's great to see that a majority of the public open space is being retained in the centre of the precinct. Uh, an opportunity for kids to run and to play and for those dogs to be walked, as well as hosting many of the events that are already using Hall Park. The shared path network will also receive significant upgrades, with the proposed paths being made wider, which is great for scooter-loving kids or for families like mine who have a family member uh, in a wheelchair. The design of the paths will be also be incredibly beneficial for our veterans when marching up to our amazing war memorial. As a kayak owner, I'm also stoked to see the plans for an all abilities paddle launch facility. And if it's anything like the one that's in Riverside Gardens, this might become the most popular area of the precinct. And as we just heard, the well-supported commercial area, which will consist of the microbrewery, mini golf, cafe and chocolate factory, will complete this precinct, a development that will contribute both economic and community benefits. And, has, and it has been designed in keeping with the nature of the Western Foreshore, ensuring maximum retention of vegetation. It's good to see many of the community's concerns being addressed as part of the recommendations, including the environmental impact of the development, as well as parking and traffic management. It's that feedback from the community that has enabled officers to address those concerns and these matters will be dealt with. It's a shame that the discussion has been all about a brewery. The creation of this precinct is so much more than that, especially to families like mine and other local families. 
that are incredibly excited for their children to use the public open space, to use the proposed sporting um, goals that, that are uh, planned for the village green. I thoroughly enjoy spending time with my family down there, as I uh, explained, but I'm also excited about the opportunity that once my son has, has finished shooting hoops at the basketball uh, hoops, and while my daughter um, has finished playing at the playground, that we all have the opportunity uh, for a meal at this proposed family-friendly restaurant in an area that has been described numerous times as underutilised. And I urge my fellow councillors to join me in supporting the officers' recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Wilkins. Councillor Cumboy. By all accounts that I've heard, the Shelter Brewery is an excellent establishment. Um, brings in the people, always good energy, and everyone that I've spoken to has said it is a fantastic venue. I think Mandra will not regret having a waterfront shelter brewery in attracting people. Um, and I would now challenge the city. We have this fantastic marina in Dolphin Key. We will now have this fantastic waterfront development on the Western Foreshore. And we have a, a massive commercial hole in the middle, which is our non-existent CBD. And I think we've got the pillars at each end and I'm really excited to be a part of the city in the next 10 years in filling in the middle with something awesome and uh, creative. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cumberworth. Any speakers against? Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, fellow councillors, there's not really a lot that I can say further to what I've already said earlier. Uh, the reality is... You'll find something, Councillor. I'm working on it. The reality is I do not believe that a restaurant slash microbrewery is the right business to have in that location. The golf course, yes, not so sure about the chocolate factory personally, uh, but again, the public submissions were there for a reason. This is what I've based my decisions on and I hope it all works out well. Thank you, Councillor. Any speakers for the motion? Councillor Rogers. Uh, thank you. Not to say uh, anything new. I agree with the <coughs> the movers, uh, uh, mover and seconders um, sentiments, and I thought that they were well put. I think just to pull something from the report, uh, talking about the the draft um, schedule of implementation measures for the leisure, leisure precinct. Um, master plan um, has been prepared. Ultimately, it's going to become subject to council approval once we get to the final concept plan. And there are some exciting um, aspects around that, such as commercial activation, uh, that war memorial upgrade, the, the avenue of honour, uh, which was um, spoken to by um, Councillor Wilkins. Uh, the asset renewal works again in relation to the War Memorial, that village green recreation and event space. There was a lot of commentary that I was hearing in deputations about concern uh, that we were losing Hall Park and we were losing the green space. Well, this is going to be a reinvestment uh, into revitalising uh, a green space uh, and, and that village concept um, that, that Mandra has uh, and uh, revitalising that sense of ownership of public space. Uh, there's the shared youth path, uh, path network, uh, security, lighting, signage, um, security and lighting, obviously something that is massive and comes up again and again and again in community perception surveys about the need to have um, safety measures invested in in Mandra. Um, there's an example of something that is possible. The under the bridge event space and mural artwork, uh, we're starting to see more work that is uh, more events that are taking place um, underneath the bridge uh, and it would be good to upgrade that space. The public jetty installation, the Leighton Place, Mary Street uh, intersection and public transport upgrade, we've heard a lot about that uh, over the last, um, what feels like four hours. Uh, the all abilities paddle launch facility and swimming area pontoon also to be confirmed. So that's a substantial um, investment into public space uh, and, and with that, notwithstanding that it still needs to be signed off by council, very excited about the possibility that can yield for this uh, impressive area. Thank you. Any speakers opposed? Any speakers wishing to speak against the motion? It's Councillor Burns. 
Thank you, Chair. I, I speak against the motion because in, in many ways I think if you are speaking against, you're obliged to give those reasons to do that. I find myself unable to support the officer recommendation for the overall concept master plan. The, the plan, as I explained earlier on, fundamentally it is inconsistent with me to endorse this plan because it's, it's fundamentally based on a premise that I, I don't agree with, which I made those points pretty clear. And I'd like to comment that likewise, as did the public who made deputations and my colleagues in the chamber. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone wish to speak for the motion? I'll invite the mover to close. Councillor Wilkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, the opposition um, from Councillor Schumacher and Councillor Burns, and as always, I um, uh, really respect your opinions. Um, community have helped shape um, this precinct, and um, and are really the main drivers behind it. And um, and I'm I'm really excited to to deliver this for them. So uh, again, I encourage my fellow councillors to support the recommendations and and see this precinct be created. Thank you, Councillor Wilkins. I'll now put the motion. Those in favour? Councillor Kearns. Thank you, Councillor Kearns. It's in favour of the motion. Those that are opposed? Councillor Schumacher, Councillor Zalani and Councillor Burns as opposed. The motion is carried. Councillors, thank you very much. The next item is uh, in relation to the Waterways Waterfront Master Plan. Is there a mover and a seconder for the officer's recommendation? Yes, Councillor Schumacher. Thank you. The Deputy Mayor has seconded it. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to uh, the officers and staff involved in writing the Waterways Waterways Waterfront Master Plan. Uh, it was a bit lighter reading than the uh, first two reports, which was I'm very grateful for. Uh, in, in general, I'm very happy with the plan. I think it's, it's, it is a great plan. It looks after our waterfront, including our sandy beaches, and I support it fully. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Deputy Mayor. connection, access, uh, natural beauty and uh, atmosphere, and these will drive the future uh, opportunities. Uh, the plan has been driven by community engagement with an amazing 3,400 visits to the uh, master plan on Mandra Matters, and I think that's quite an incredible number. Uh, we are a community of boat-loving peoples so that are planning for infrastructure upgrades and enhance and protect our environmentally sensitive waterfront is uh, so very important. Um, the plan has an indicative uh, design that suggests a potential new landing adjacent to the Darimpool uh, Park, um, its shaded seating to the planted areas along the foreshore edge and all abilities, uh, paddling launch facilities. So I look forward to seeing these things come to fruition. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Is there anyone wishing to speak against the motion? Yeah, yes, Councillor Cumberwood. Um, in general, it's a great waterways waterfront master plan. Uh, the point that I object to is turning Manjar Bay into a boating hub with a no swimming zone. And I would ask, are we going to prevent dolphins from swimming in the area? Um, dolphins are- I'll take that as a rhetorical question, Council. Dolphins are Mandra's number one tourist attraction. And I have significant experience with the dolphins in Mandra, having uh, operated the commercial ferries around the waterways for a number of years. Now, Manjar Bay is a special place for dolphins. They bring their young, they teach them to fish. Um, from a tourism perspective, people walk along the jetties and they can see the dolphins. Uh, it's essentially still water in Manjar Bay, which makes it the perfect place for paddling kayaks and non-powered water activities. A more appropriate place to increase our boat parking would be in front of the museum. Uh, it's beyond the bridge, so people don't really see it as part of the city, but if you're on foot, it's right there. It's right opposite, you know, you walk under the bridge, you're at um, 
you know, right in the heart of Mandra. There's a massive area of deep water there that's underutilised. Now, if you drive your boat from the main channel into the Mandra Performing Arts Centre, that's five minutes it takes to drive in there. So it's, it's quite a long way and I do not support turning Manja Bay into a boating hub. That is essentially taking our most prized waterfront asset and turning it into a car park. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cumberworth. Are there any further speakers for uh, there being none? I'll invite the mover to close. Is, is your call, Councillor Schumacher? You're the, you're the mover. No, no, it's just, a, just a question that I made. Um, many years ago, and it has to do with the boating, many years ago there was uh, Ford planning for Ocean Marina. Um, obviously that hasn't happened. Is it still on our I can't remember honestly if it was state government or us that was doing that. Councillor, that, that was a concept plan that had no level of detail or any government commitment and as far as I'm aware it's not made up of any government policy or agenda. Thank you. It was a long time ago. You are younger than me. Yes. And any uh, uh, councillor, yes, councillor Jackson. Just a procedural uh, question. Yes. Is um, councillor Cumberworth able to move an amendment? It depends on the nature of the amendment. If it also, if it substantially alters uh, the motion on the table, then it would need to be a foreshadowed motion. Uh, I think changing a major precinct would be a substantial um, shift in the motion, and therefore, councillor Cumberworth, you'd be better off foreshadowing your intention to move a different motion should this motion fail. I foreshadow a different motion. I'll note that Councillor Cumberworth foreshadows his intention to move a different motion should this motion fail. Councillor, can you make it? Uh, yeah. I'm trying to close the motion. Um, so, is there a question, Councillor, quickly? Uh, to the relevant officer, could the CEO or the relevant officer speak to how the concept plan, just to get right in my mind, how the concept plan then equates into more material plans, and would those decisions typically come before council? In which case, Cumble, uh, Councillor Cumberworth's concerns could be raised and directly considered by council. Thank you. I'll turn the question to the CEO, to the director of built and natural environment. Uh, through the mayor, so the process will be to develop concepts um, and more detail around these proposals, and yes, they will definitely be coming back um, to elected members uh, and to council ultimately to decide around allocation of funding, um, if I can, um, certainly um, the, the issues that have been raised by Councillor Cumbleworth uh, are certainly well noted. Um, I suppose the master plan has tried to balance um, reasonably modest um, boat usage compared to some of the previous plans uh, with the usage uh, of, that, uh, of that area, but certainly around the environmental impacts, um, around restrictions around speed, and obviously management of crafts will be carefully considered. Um, and particularly around, I guess, the ability to swim around those areas where there's boat traffic. Certainly, um, that was a, a mitigation, particularly around public safety. But um, certainly the point is uh, well made and will certainly be considered by officers as we progress um, through the next stages, if that's what our council decide to do. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Cumberworth. Um, notwithstanding those comments, um, if you wish to uh, foreshadow uh, your intention uh, to move a different motion, that option is still available to you. Uh, yes, I'd foreshadow a motion to change the location of the boating hub. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Schumacher, please close. Uh, nothing further, thank you. Thank you. I'll put the motion noting that Councillor Cumberworth has foreshadowed his intention to move a different motion should this motion fail. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Councillor Zalani, the mover has closed and I put no, the motion. What is the foreshadow motion will be? Uh, he, the Councillor Cumberworth doesn't have to note that now unless this motion's. Uh, he, he can or he. He may choose not to. In this case, what he's indicated is that um, it would be uh, involve moving the um, the pen area that's currently in Manjar Bay. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Those opposed? Uh, Councillor Kearns, um, how do you vote? In favour of the motion, Councillor Kearns. Those opposed? Councillor Cumberworth, the motion has passed. Um, we'll now go to the review of the grants and donations policy. Is there a mover and a seconder for the officer's recommendation? Moved, Councillor Pond. Seconded. Yep. Councillor 
Rogers, thank you. Councillor Rogers, Councillor Moore. Um, I uh, urge my fellow colleagues to um, endorse the grants policy. Um, I think the grants program does much to assist the community to play a role in delivering elements of the strategic community plan. Um, there's so much that small funding to groups and organizations within our community can achieve and can really un unleash um, uh, the power of community along the way. Um, I think the presented revised policy provides a very significant improvement over the existing policy, so I commend the officers for the work on that. Um, it provides improved clarity uh, through improved definitions, guidance, the applicability of the policy, and the governance arrangements, such as providing clear delegation of decision making uh, on the grants themselves. Um, I like very much that it limits the ability of applicants um, and elected members to interfere with what is essentially an operational process. If we approve a, a policy um, that uh, uh, has clear delegations within uh, the city administration, um, there's really no reason for for elected members to be in, or other parties to be uh, lobbying within that space. So I think that's very good. Um, and I also uh, endorse the three new funds that it's proposing, the new group startup funds. Again, a little bit can go a real long way in getting people mobilized on things, so that's very good. The milestone celebrations, those are things that come up, but we're limiting it to 50-year cycles on, on those, so we're not celebrating. We've been here three years, yay! Um, so it makes it a very significant sort of thing. Um, and I find the, uh, the Meet Your Neighbors program very interesting, something that gets people knowing their neighbors and interacting with their communities. And if you want to be supporting a, a safer and, um, uh, I'm not thinking of the right word, cooperative, uh, communicative neighborhoods, um, well, that's a really good way about going about it. So I would encourage everybody to support the policy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Tom, Councillor Jack. Uh, not much further to add, very thorough um, uh, explanation on the benefits of the amended policy from, from the mover. I'm happy to support uh, the grants and funding policy, the amendments that are in there, and, and just one item to, to raise, which was that um, in the interest of governance being seen to be done, um, that we considered these uh, new uh, grant funds uh, in a briefing meeting and did a bit of a workshop as, a, as an elected member group and there were items that um, council decided to strip back on as well to say we don't really think we'll be getting much bang for our buck in terms of those grants. So the, the, the list that we've got here I think is uh, relevant uh, and uh, tested and, and will have some value to it. Thank you Councillor Rogers. Is there anyone wishing to speak against the motion? Any questions? There be none, I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Councillor Kearns. <coughs> in favour of the motion. Those opposed, the motion is carried unanimously. Uh, Councillors, uh, we'll now come to the welcome to country and acknowledgement of country policy. Is there a mover and a seconder for the officer's recommendation? Moved to Councillor Wright, seconded to Councillor Wilkins. Councillor Wright. Uh, first of all, thanks to the officers and through you, Chair. Also, he's not here now, but Mr. Wally, local elder, and his comments around education in particular with regards to how far we've come as a society. I look back on my own life as a child growing up in the goldfields and remember going to the Mount Margaret Mission, which is up near Laverton, which in itself is in the middle of nowhere, about 360 k's northeast of Kalgoorlie. But we went there and there was nothing welcoming about it. And so I look at something like this and the acknowledgement to come here and being a school principal who's been to Muller District High School, 100% Aboriginal people. Uh, we didn't do Welcome to Country there, and that's in Yamaji Country, which is kind of where this is all stemmed from. Um, I remember Ernie Dingo came to the school once and his nephew was there and we were talking about it. And it's a means 
in my eyes, for those people who aren't heavily involved in educating Aboriginal people or heavily involved in an Aboriginal community to actually pay their respects to Aboriginal people, like it or not, they have been on the receiving end more often than not since British settlement. It was a very hard time for them, a massive change to their lifestyle. And it is about reconciliation. I really want to say thanks to the officers for making this a personal decision-making policy. I don't feel that anything authentic comes out of giving an acknowledgement to country when you don't mean it. And it comes across as tokenistic. And it's interesting that the youth advisory group in particular identified that as one of their points in their feedback to the council. Kids are particularly good at picking up on those things. And as adults in the room, look, I don't have much more to say other than there is a personal decision in opportunity for personal decision making within this policy and if this is one way it goes towards reconciliation and bringing everyone along we're certainly in a far better position and as far as George goes I and Leanne his wife who's a teacher at my school I cannot think of two people who do more and walk more in both white society or well, non-aboriginal society and aboriginal society and do more for reconciliation in how they go about it by always acknowledging both sides of the story. So I would just say, well written, I think we do need that policy in place and the opportunity to actually put a bit of personal choice into there as to whether and using our discretion as professionals whether one is warranted. I appreciate that, so thank you. Thanks very much Councillor Wright. Councillor Wilkins. Thank you Mayor and thank you Councillor Wright for sharing some personal uh, stories, that was really interesting. Um, the City of Mandurah has a great history of respectfully working with uh, the traditional custodians of the land, the Binjara people. Uh, adopting this policy not only acknowledges the cultural importance of Welcome to Country by Aboriginal people and its importance to our city's heritage and identity, but also provides direction and support to officers for Welcome to Country and Acknowledgement to Country protocols. Uh, it also lays out who can conduct them and when to observe Welcome the Country and who approves them. For me personally, Welcome the Country is usually the highlight of any event, especially if it's accompanied, accompanied with a story about the cultural significance of that particular area. And as uh, Councillor Wright highlighted, uh, we are incredibly lucky to have um, one of the best storytellers in Mandra, in George Wally, and uh, thankfully there's a time limit on his dep deputation because that could have gone on for some time. Um, happy to support the officer's recommendations to adopt the amended uh, policy and thanks to those who helped create it um, the, and especially the representatives from Winjan and the officers from the City of Mandra. Thank you Councillor Wilkins. Is there anyone wish to speak against the motion? Councillor Burns. Thank you Chair. Uh, I now speak to discuss a matter of importance uh, regarding our approach to the welcome to country and acknowledgement to country ceremonies. I also note the deputation by Mr Wally and his contribution to Mandra. As we all know, these rituals are now considerable significance uh, for many in our community. However, it is crucial that we address the concerns surrounding their current implementation in our city. I would like to start by quoting Anthony Dillon, an esteemed Indigenous academic and commentator, who recently expressed concerns about the overuse of these rituals. He stated, the practices of welcome to country and acknowledgement of country have drawn criticisms for several years now, but seem to be intensified in the past couple of years. The result being that not only does it strain relations between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians, but it also causes division within each of these two cultural groups. A common criticism is that these practices are performed too often. I agree that they are overused and furthermore are becoming almost mandatory for every occasion. So that was Anthony Dillon, an article published not long ago. His perspective is vital as it highlights how the overuse of such rituals can lead to division rather than unity within our community. For clarity, let me state up front that I don't oppose or I don't propose to ban the welcome of the country and nor do I make it similar to suggest that we make it compulsory. My focus here is on responsible governance and fiscal accountability. Well over a year ago I investigated significant overspending against the previous policy. 
This prompted an internal review and an acceptance by city staff that the current policy needed significant improvement. While certain government improvements have been made, unfortunately the amended policy does not go far enough to address my concerns that Anthony Dillon so well articulated in his article. According to the financial implications section of the report, the city admits that this policy change is cost neutral. By implication, this, it is unlikely that we will see a significant reduction in cost to the ratepayer. In conclusion, while the revised policy makes improvements, it does not adequately address the critical issues of cost management that have been my primary concerns. Given that the policy remains cost neutral without offering a clear strategy for reducing expenses, I can't support it in its current form. Therefore, I urge my, urge my fellow councillors to vote against this policy. It is crucial that we prioritise both responsible fiscal management and genuine respect for our community's cultural practices. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Burns. Is there anyone wish to speak against the motion? Sorry, Sorry anyone wish to speak for the motion? Councillor, you've already spoken. Yeah. The second. No, sorry, my bad. <laughs> no, I'm the other guy with glasses. Um, <laughs> it's good to be moved, Councillor Seriously, put him back, um, Councillor So just a simple point from me. If we are concerned about overuse of welcome to country, having no policy in place would provide no guidance as to when it is going to be used. The policy states that welcome to country is to be used for major conferences, major events and citizenship ceremonies. Voting against the recommendation, in my view, leads to overuse. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak against the motion? Councillor Schumacher? Uh, question. Question, Mike. Councillor. Um, if I remember from reading the report, because the memory is not so good these days, there, there was no budget, annual budget for the welcome to countries. Could I have comment as to if I'm correct? And if so, why isn't there? Thank you. I'll direct the question to the Director of Place and Community. Thank you for your question. Through the Mayor, the City doesn't set aside a separate budget line where all welcome to country um, expenditure is from. It actually, um, I guess, uses the expenditure accounts from a specific project or event or initiative so um, we can reflect this, the cost of that event. Um, so we do budget for it um, through our events that the ones that we know in advance um, will be having a welcome. Thank you. Anyone wish to speak against the motion? Councillor Jackson has a question. Uh, just to acknowledge Councillor Burns and Councillor Rogers, um, both make sense at the same time. Um, so I'm just wondering, could I get comment um, from an officer? What are the implications if this policy is, is knocked back tonight? What happens then? Thank you, I'll direct the question. The CEO. Um, if this policy is not approved um, and the other, uh, so it depends on whether it's deferred or there is no policy for council, so there's two um, different situations. If it's deferred, the previous policy, the, the current policy that is currently has been adopted by council previously, will be um, the current policy, and then if it were, there was no policy at all by council, uh, then there is no direction in relation to a welcome to, co uh, welcome to country or acknowledgement of country. So um, that would leave the city, um, there is uh, budgets in the events um, or programs that we have that includes uh, a component for a welcome to country. Uh, so we would continue as is for those events that have a budget allocated, however, for any others, we would have to um, do, uh, put forward to council consideration of um, budget variations each time that we have um, we've identified uh, identified a program that hasn't considered a budget allocation uh, for a welcome to country. In relation to expenditure over um, the last financial year, the city spent eleven thousand dollars on. Um, Welcome to country for all of its events and citizenship ceremonies. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to speak against the motion? Uh, I'll invite the mover to close. Question. Councillor Schumacher. So, but the question to, to, sorry, through the chair to, to the relevant officer. So, there is no limit on 
no, no top top uh, figure of what the city can spend on welcoming the country. Thank you, Director. Thank you, um, through you, Mayor. Um, the policy itself is not a framework that's setting a budget cap for a welcome to country. So, in that end, I guess you could say it's limitless because we, uh, I guess, we're not setting a number but it's intended that the policy has sufficient controls that are additional to the previous policy around uh, seeking approval from the CEO, uh, director or executive manager. Um, and it does give more guidance around what is a notable event. So it's a little bit difficult for us to, to prepare a finite list of what is a notable event because sometimes we don't know um, that far in advance when we set the budget so so the policy uh, should provide a framework for responsible spending thank you councillor i'm looking to wrap this up so if you wish to speak against it please do so i i, I do speak against it but very if this will put gently and that is in relation to the governance role that, I, that we have as a councillor, and not having a full understanding of the budget, which there should be one per annum. The idea of the reality is where it sits now, it is limitless. Well, it's something similar to that. You know, and I'm sure, I am sure officers would not, and the city staff would, wouldn't take it to the extremes. I know that. However, we still have a role with governance to be responsible for the ratepayers' money. Um, I'll speak for the motion. We um, hold events all the time, and we don't budget for the number of dollars that we spend in the entirety of the city on cupcakes, nor do we send, spend, uh, have a budget in our approved budget for the amount that we'll spend on chairs. We don't budget that way. We budget per program and per project. And the guidance in the policy is about providing a framework that gives officers direction on when to initiate a welcome to country and include it in the project budget and when not to. If we start going down the path of trying to budget uh, for every single group of expenditure, then our budgeting processes will become completely unmanageable. And so I would really encourage council, um, this is just not how we go about doing our business. We budget in programs and in projects, and the policy is the governance mechanism to enable the staff to determine whether there should be a budget allocation or not. Okay. Are there any other speakers against the motion? There be none. I'll invite the movement to close. Not too much more. I take the point on the finance side of things. Ultimately, whether you've come here 50,000 years ago, your family had, or you've arrived yesterday, the Aboriginal people have been one of the longest enduring cultures within the world. Part of reconciliation and understanding what they went through since British settlement, I think this is a way to do it and I don't have any uh, worries about the acknowledgement to country as it stands. So I'll ask you to vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Councillor Kearns? Those opposed? Councillor Burns is in favour. The motion's carried. Is it nearly to o'clock? Let the record show that Councillor Burns is against and the motion is carried. The next item is the finance report and I'll invite the manager for finance to come to the microphone to give his presentation. And because I'm being well behaved, as directed by the Director of Business Services, I won't make a comment that the manager should be pleased that the gallery had departed prior to his presentation. <laughs> now we've lost a council. To the manager of finance. Can you give me two seconds? I need to share it. Okay. Uh, thank you through through the mayor. Uh, the finance report. Not, we need to wait for the signal. Uh, thank you. Uh, through the Mayor, the finance report for June uh, 2024. Um, and just before I get started on the graphs, uh, while the report is for June 2024, uh, there are accounting adjustments 
uh, additional invoices that we received after the report and reserve reconciliations that will provide us a year-end figure, uh, which we will know after the audit is conducted in November uh, to be presented to Council in December, uh, all being well. Uh, so moving on to the, the first graphs for operating, uh, we can see that operating income actually tipped a little bit above uh, the budget at year-end. Uh, operating expenditure is right on budget where we like to see it. For the next lot of graphs for capital, uh, these graphs look a little bit strange, uh, but that is due to the accounting adjustments that still need to be done on capital. Uh, you will see in the capital expenditure, the budget has tipped down as a result of the carryovers that were adopted in May. <coughs> uh, the rates receivable um, dipped down in April, but has tipped up a little bit in May and June due to a heavy couple of months um, processing interim invoices uh, for rates. So we ended up with 96.1% collected in June 24, as opposed to 97.8% collected at the same time last year. However, that is due to interims uh, being processed in the last couple of months. Uh, the budget variations I'll take as read as they are in the report. Um, and for the June 2024 tenders, the CEO uh, did approve three tenders. Um, and I'd also like to add that the City of Mandra observed the tender evaluation process and is satisfied that the probity and procedural aspects relating to the evaluation were compliant. Thank you, Mr. King. Is there a mover and a seconder for the motion? Move to Councillor Wilkett, Councillor Rogers, second to Councillor Schumacher, Councillor Rogers. Stop. Uh, so, uh, look, with the major caveat, we'll see what the auditors have to say. Um, Congratulations on a on a great financial year um, to to our to our staff um, in terms of what actual expenditure has looked like um, uh, against our budget. Uh, it, we seem to have got this thing down to a fine art in terms of what we can predict. And can I also um, pass on my um, congratulations? Um, again, for the constant tweaking of these monthly financial reports and the financial story that it tells us uh, back as elected members on the governance body. Um, just noting all of the variations that are contained within the report, and then one um, item that I think is of particular interest is the surplus. Uh, the actual surplus for the period of 8.1 um, million, noting that the manager of finance spoke about uh, the commitments, so most of that is going to be carried forward. But there is one important point in here um, that's on page 465 of the uh, of the uh, of the agenda pack that the 24-25 annual budget has estimated that will be an all all allocated surplus of 600,000, which is included in the actual surplus and will be used to offset the amount that is required from rates to fund programs and services for 24-25, easing pressure on uh, uh, the rate payers by rolling forward that surplus. Um, so good job and happy to support the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Schumacher. All right, just very quickly, I, I think there would be um, many a local government um, in WA, but not Australia, that would be very jealous of having uh, rates at 96, 97% paid. So that's all of it. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone wishing to speak against? I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Councillor Kearns? I'll declare the motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillor. The next item is the review of providing low tables and management arrangements. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the officer's recommendation? Councillor Smith, seconded Councillor Wilkins. Councillor Smith. Um, firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging the obvious hard work uh, put into the plans by Brendan Engel and Donna Walker and their teams. Um, it's a very comprehensive plan, uh, found it extremely thorough, easy to read, well formatted. Um, I especially appreciated the added dependencies with contact information at the end of the documents. Um, so the local emergency management arrangements are a requirement to cover the emergency management aspect of prevention, preparedness, response and recovery for the district. Um, I'd just like to note that in the general plan, uh, which was the first report, uh, Western Australia has adopted the Australian Warning System for bushfire, cyclone, flood and storm warnings, which is a new national approach to warnings using a consistent set of icons Australia-wide, just to help reduce any confusion during a disaster. 
I'd also like to note that in section 7.5 of the general plan regarding evacuation centres, um, that oh no, not, it's not documented, city officers would utilise City of Mandra buildings south of the Dawesville Cut, such as the Port Bouvard Surf Life Saving Club or the Port Bouvard Sport Rec Club if necessary. Um, and investigations will be made as to the suitability of the Dawesville Community Centre as a potential centre for the south once it's been completed. Um, in relation to the recovery plan, I appreciate the breakdown of responsibilities of external agencies, state government and us at a local government level. Um, I definitely feel safer living in our community knowing that we've got these policies to fall back on in time of need. So thank you very much for your hard work. Um, I'd like to recommend the approval of both the local emergency management general plan and the local emergency management recovery plan and endorse both to the state emergency management committee for approval. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Wilkins. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, local governments play a crucial role when responding uh, to and the management of uh, emergencies in their area, um, something the City of Mandurah have done extremely well over the years and with uh, the review of the local emergency management arrangements uh, should continue to do well into the future. Uh, in my role as a press photographer, I'm often on the other side of these emergencies and last year when homes and lives were uh, under threat from fires, um, I saw just how pivotal uh, the response was uh, from the city of Mandurah and how capable the Mandurah Aquatic Centre is as an evacuation city, uh, evacuation centre, sorry. Um, thanks to everyone who worked on this thorough plan, including um, Councillor Jess Smith, uh, who is the chair of the Local Emergency Management Committee and happy to support the officer's recommendations to approve uh, this plan. Thank you, Councillor Wilkins. Are there any questions? Is there anyone wishing to speak against? There be none. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Councillor Kearns? She's left. Councillor Kearns has left the meeting. I'll declare the motion carried. The next item is report number eight, the panel of pre-qualified supplier panel delegation and minor amendments. And I ask for a mover and a seconder. Move the Deputy Mayor. Seconded Councillor Number Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Look, just happy to move the recommendation as set before you that we adopt um, the delegation for a panel of pre-qualified suppliers for goods and services and also um, adopt the proposed amendments um, to DACP M02 for the invite expressions of interest and tenders. Thank Nothing you. more. Councillor Cumberworth. Um, happy to support empowering the CEO to uh, select a panel of suppliers to increase efficiency and hopefully economic benefit to the city. Thank you. Are there any questions? Is there anyone wishing to speak against? If there be none, I'll put the motion. Those in favour? That's unanimous. Well done. Um, we'll now proceed uh, with the meeting behind closed doors. Mr Wilcock, we're giving you the keys to the city. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
was the big F is now proceeding with open doors. Can I have a move for a second the, the council endorsed the resolution to make behind closed doors? Move to ask the a second to pass the bond. Is there anyone opposed? The motion is carried. With all items having been concluded, I'll close the meeting at 9.45.